give give me a minute. We'll send a, after after uh, Miss Johnson gets taken care of. The chamber um, speakers are turned on over there. Can you turn them off? Just giving a um, a reverberating sound. Okay, great. Okay, so they're coming to the rescue for you, Vice Mayor. I think we can probably go ahead and maybe start as long as Kateri is ready. Very good. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting. This is a virtual meeting scheduled for 4 p.m. on Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. I'm present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Mr. Boylston. Here. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. Here. Let's stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Okay, so we have um, we had a preemptive hand up with uh, Commissioner Cassell. I'm going to give you the floor. I know that we're going into agenda approval, but you said you wanted to start with something, so I'm going to yeah, recognize you. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It is regarding the agenda and I'm moving to strike uh, seven F items from the agenda because it wasn't properly calendared or noticed uh, in accordance with our Delray Beach policies, specifically administrative procedures, uh, policies and procedure manual number GA6 revision two, excuse me, I'm reading this from my computer. Item GA62 and if you go down to G says uh, agenda items should be entered into Legistar with a complete agenda cover memo and backup items attached for review by the city manager and mayor at their meetings, usually held a week prior to the commission or workshop meeting. The draft agenda will be approved at the conclusion of the city manager and mayor's review of the agenda. No other agenda items, and this is in bold, shall be added after the meeting has concluded. There are exceptions for emergencies, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes on to item H, which I'm gonna read. Final changes to all agenda items must be completed by 5 p.m. on Friday, which is Friday before the meeting. And here's the issue I have. I got this document, 124 pages yesterday at four o'clock and I got it through the attachment of, through looking through the agenda. So, you know, there's reasons for requiring adequate notice. The residents didn't get adequate notice. And, and frankly, I don't think I did. How am I supposed to properly assess a 124 page document overnight? I had meetings last night and I had meetings all day today. This is by far the most significant item on our budget. It isn't a one-time expenditure. It establishes a payment framework that binds the city and commits the taxpayers to revenue well into the future. And I think it deserves a fair debate, but I, that can't happen when I'm given 24 hours to review a 124 page document and vote on it. Thank you. Um. I'm going to be honest with you, Commissioner Cassell, I, I haven't had a chance to go over it as well. So I, I am with you 100%. This was um, not something that uh, was given to us with any kind of notice. I don't think that the public, like you said, has had a chance to review it and evaluate. I know that when we have very important items on our agenda, we go through a, a first read, a second read, and then a, and an approval. Those are the real important agenda items. We are really actually get, have been given this in a last minute um, effort. And, and in, in all good faith, it's not something that I don't think that we can't 
have a discussion about and come to a conclusion of. But the very beginning of this started off from my perspective, just since you've opened up this um, issue, was we were not, we had a consensus that we were not going to um, negotiate this contract at this point. Now, we did have an executive session that, um, you know, steered it in a different direction. I understand that. But um, again, um, this is not an, an, an absolute, you know, um, an item that has to be pushed through for any kind of sensitivity level other than that we are basically facing an election. And that's the way it, I guess it rolls. So I'm with you. Okay, wait, I appreciate your comments and I thank you, but I wanna talk to our attorney about this because this is not something that I'm asking for as a consideration. This is our policies that were not followed. I remember we sat in a meeting and I think uh, Vice Mayor Boylston correctly stated, we've got a one page document. He said, I don't want to get something and then have it at the meeting. I need at least 24 hours. This is a 124 page document, the most substantial contract in our city. And we aren't given time to assess it. That's unacceptable. So attorney Jellen, could you please speak to how do we enforce our own policies and procedures with respect to this agenda item? Um, so, you know, the city, the city does have its own policies and procedures for the agenda preparation, like you just read. Um, just, just to be clear, though, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to be mistaken. So, we do have a policy that does, you know, pr provide a procedure for how the agenda should be prepared and the guidelines and time limits and things like that. Obviously, emergencies come up, and you know, I know I've done this. I've added things to the agenda late, and you know, sometimes it is what it is. There's no statutory notice that's required for the collective bargaining agreement. So it's not a situation where Florida statute has dictated that you have a 10 day notice period or something like that. That's not the case here. So um, that was a policy. I believe it was drafted by Mr. Lozier, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, so, um, you know, do we like to follow our own policies? Yes, but there's, there's exceptions and um, I think it's it's up to the commission to weigh whether or not this is an exception to the, the policies and procedures that have been outlined by a former city manager, which are in place. Policies don't expire. So it is it is a, a policy that's currently in place. It says there are exceptions for emergencies. Those are the exceptions. This is not an emergency. Uh, well, I think that's for the commission to determine whether or not it's an emergency. And I think there should be a debate um, as to whether or not this would uh, qualify as an emergency. You know, is it, is it a life health safety issue? No, but it is a matter that candidly, um, the last agreement did expire back in October. So, I mean, this is something that has been through no fault in every, uh, of anybody sitting here, especially this commission. So, you know, it's not a situation where this commission delayed it. We were in a pandemic, we had issues with staff, and we work through it. So um, I think whether or not it's an emergency, I think that's something for you to decide. If the commission had, there's a consensus that there is some relative importance to this and should be dealt with today, then, then you know, that's the commission's pleasure. Today, if we haven't had the opportunity to go through all the documents, it's 124 pages long. I myself had appointments last night and I had appointments all day today. I woke up, woke up at 4.30 and started reading this. It's 124 pages long. How can we vote on something that we haven't had the opportunity to properly review? So, well, okay, so ideally, yes, we should all be um, up to speed on what's before you. I know that you have had meetings with, with staff. I know I've met with all of you and discussed this individually as well. And again, this is, there's nothing improper about putting this on the agenda. So let's just be very clear about that. You know, I think we also have to understand that the union has rights just as well as the city has rights. And we would never want to infringe upon anybody's rights. And we want to make sure that this is fair to everybody. So, um, you know, staff has been working very hard, I can tell you, behind the scenes trying to get this on an agenda for your review. I'm not going to disagree that unfortunately it was added to the agenda very late. Obviously, that's not our intent. Our intent was to have it to you earlier than that. 
but because of process, because of people's schedules, including my own, it did get delayed for your review. I can tell you that my understanding is that you have been briefed as to the changes. Understandably, it's 124 pages, but 124 pages weren't changed. So the specific articles that were changed, I do understand that they have been briefed to you. However, you know, I would never want a commission to vote on something for which they're not entirely um, up to speed on. And unfortunately, you do have an obligation to vote unless you have a voting conflict, which I don't believe anybody has here. So again, I think this is a debate for you as a commission. Um, if, you, if you wanted to table it and have a special meeting in 48 hours, you could do that. Um, I know that's not I, I know that's not the ideal situation because we do have a, an election next week and things like that. But again, a lot of what we're discussing right now, it's not necessarily legal. I think it's more for your for your decision and for your debate. And at the end of the day, you should come to a consensus where everybody feels comfortable on what they're voting on and that they have been properly educated on what the changes on the, on the matters are. I can tell you if you do have questions, I know Mr. Norton and Mr. Lynn are going to be made available to you later on in this meeting. So those can be answered if you feel comfortable doing that. But again, I think right now, I think the commission should discuss whether or not um, an emergency exists that justify putting this on late. And in the event that you wanted to schedule a special meeting because there's consensus to have that, I think that discussion should be had now. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cassell, are you finished? I guess so. I'm requesting that my colleagues, as a courtesy, because we received a 124 page document that I would like to review thoroughly, okay. allow for a meeting on this. That's what okay. I'm asking for. All right, the commission has their hands up. I don't know who in what order. Do we know who was first? I'll just go from the uh, top down. Vice, Vice Mayor Bolston was first. I believe I was okay. second and then Commissioner Frankel. Thank you. I, I wasn't watching, so I appreciate that, Deputy Vice Mayor. So Vice Mayor of Wilson. Yeah, I would just like to echo, uh, and I really appreciate um, to the Attorney Jellin for for stating all of that. This is this is not dumping a 124, 28 page document on us. This has been going on for six months. We haven't had a contract with our fire union in six months. That's the urgency. Um, we've worked out all of the details. In fact, we're all in an executive session uh, a week ago. Um, now there were individuals in that room that weren't even willing to have a discussion and work towards a solution. Uh, and then there was individuals in that room, including our staff on both sides of this negotiation that were very willing to continue the conversation and get across the finish line. A lot of work has gone into this, a lot of consideration, an incredible amount of compromise. And you know, I apologize if you don't trust our city attorney and our city manager who are, who are very much behind this contract and working very hard on it, and that you weren't keeping up over the last six months while this contract has gone back and forth. I've gotten regular updates from, from Dwayne's, uh, DeAndre, in regards to where we're at in the negotiations. It's gone back and forth. I think this is the sixth or seventh iteration. Um, so this isn't 128 pages of new information. This is all down to the last few tweaks, which we agreed upon just last week. So I am very comfortable, uh, very prepared to move forward with the presentation and the vote tonight. And yes, it is an urgent matter. Thank you, Vice Mayor, I mean, Deputy Vice Mayor. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. I will just add one thing to what uh, Vice Mayor Boylston just stated. Um, unfortunately, this is six months late. We should have begun this back in March. And we all know what we've been doing since March of last year. So I am not willing to go another day. If we do, it's going to have to be a meeting that's going to be held this week at some convenient time. And if that's a compromise, if Commissioner uh, Cassell would like to have a couple of more days, I'm willing to do that. But it has to end, and it should end this week. I'm willing to uh, talk about it today. And I would also just like to ask if the policy, um, um, Attorney Jellin, do you know if this policy was changed? Because we did have a few policies that had been changed by our former uh, city manager. And that's for another day, but 
I'm willing to go forward tonight. If possible, a compromise would be uh, a couple of days, but uh, those but are thank mine. You for that consideration. Oh. Thank you for that consideration, Deputy Vice Mayor. I appreciate it. Commissioner, Commissioner Frankel. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. I'm ready to go forward on this item this evening. Thank you. Okay, so there is no consensus to um, withdraw that. Uh, and I don't didn't hear that there was a consensus to um, delay it unless... No, I'm excuse sorry. me, Mayor. Excuse me. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Ms. Johnson said that she would be amenable to delaying it a few days. If you okay. are as well... I, I would be. I, I have not had a chance to really go through it. And I also know that the citizens have not had a chance to go through it. And I think that that's very important. Um, uh, we might have been uh, with information, um, and I'm telling you, I, I haven't sat down with uh, with uh, all the, the final iterations um, all the way through. Um, and I know that the citizens have been left out of that uh, um, completely, 100%. So where are their rights? Uh, that's the question that I have. In addition to that, um, there to me, there is no emergency because we are not negotiating this year's contract. We have already decided that we were not going to negotiate that contract. This is for the future year's contract. So right. this is not an emergency that basically is, is uh, you know, hinging on something happening this week or next week or the week following. Um, this is something that will be part of next year's uh, um, uh, uh, changes. And so, therefore, I don't find it as an emergency, as my colleague said, um, other than the fact that there is an election. And I think that that's basically the emergency that has been um, uh, that, that is seen. And it's, and it's unfortunate because it shouldn't be. Um, we are all, uh, you know, commissioners that are working on behalf of the citizens, and we all should be making sure that the citizens um, have the information that they are rightfully entitled to to have. So if it would be um, acceptable to uh, the Deputy Vice Mayor and to Commissioner Cassell, I will join the two of you in at least giving um, 48 hours and we'll, we'll schedule an, a, a meeting. Yes, ma'am. May, may I just add to that? Because I, Ryan, Mr. Boylston, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Boylston, I did attend the meetings and I did pay attention, but the problem is when you can't leave with the documents, you're there for 30 minutes, you're looking at the documents and you're not allowed to leave with them. You can't go back and cross-reference the old contract to see what the changes are until you actually have the contract in front of you. And that wasn't until four o'clock yesterday. And, you know, in order to do my job well, I do believe we should review that contract in its entirety. And it's worth noting that once again, we had a negotiation of a union contract with the fire department that did not include our consultant attorney. And I, I'm bothered by that as I was last time, because I think the, that the residents should have an attorney involved in the negotiations. And that's the last thing I'll say. Thank you all for the accommodation. Vice Mayor Boylston, you had your hand up and then um, to Deputy Vice Mayor. I'm okay. You can go to Deputy Vice Mayor. I, I don't need to reply to that. Okay. Deputy Vice Mayor. Would uh, everyone be amenable to having a meeting on no later than Thursday? I'm good with that. A Thursday would have to be after one o'clock. I have a morning appointment. That's fine with me. Yep. Fine. One o'clock. Yep. So um, that sounds good. Now give me some time to be able to really go through this as well. Um, Can we get we a motion and a vote on that, Mayor? Right. A motion it, to it, defend. Would we just would we do it specific to that or do we want to just do it in the agenda approval? Um, I would do it specific to that just so okay. it's clear because it's going to be a special meeting. So I would um, defer it and, and, and with this, with the date and time. Okay, very good. Um, do we have a time that we know we can meet? Two o'clock. Two o'clock works for me. How about everybody else? Yeah. Yes. Ms. Casal? 
Two o'clock, yes. Okay, so can someone make a motion to defer the, um, I don't know what it was, seven, was it? F, seven F is in Frank. F. Thank you, thank you. Something's happening. All right, we can hear you if you want to put a motion forward. You're there. Oh, I'm sorry, all the screen went blank, pardon me. Um, motion to defer until Thursday. Um, sorry, I just put my calendar down. That would be the 4th, March 4th. 4th at 2 p.m., thank you. Item seven. Item 7F, excuse me. Thank you. Yes. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, call the roll please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Franco? No. Okay, motion passes. Now we're at the agenda approval. Is there any other change? Mayor? Anyone? Oh, I'm sorry. Jennifer Alvarez, you have your hand up. Uh, I don't know. Lynn might have. There you go wanted to do this, but we, we do need to request deferral of item 6L to correct um, a piece of that um, application for the LETF grant funds. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. And so any motion would include the deferral of uh, 6L. Anything else? Uh, Lynn, did I hear your, you speak out or is that about 6L? It was the same one. Thank you. Okay, very good. So entertain a motion. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. <clears throat> Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yeah. All right, very good. And uh, moving on to presentations, we've got a couple or a few of them today. So let's start with the presentation uh, by Lachey. <laughs> you don't have Lachey today. You have Ebony. <laughs> oh, okay, very good. I have her on my. I have the on the list here. Thank you, Miss Ebony. I hope to be as good as Lachey. <laughs> you will be. <laughs> okay. So, hello, Mayor and Commissioner. My name is Ebony Olivier. I am the Human Resource Generalist for the City of Delray Beach, and uh, today we will be recognizing our Technical Support Analyst. Sean McClay with Employee of the Month. Uh, so we have Mr. Jay Stacy, our Chief Technical Director, here to speak on Sean's behalf. Mr. Jay. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to uh, have a chance to highlight another member of the IT team. John is fairly new to the team, but he hit the ground running his very first week here. Now, John is one of those rare individuals that possesses technical talent as well as great customer service skills. And to try to put that in some type of context, Melissa McCarthy in one of her movies referred to the IT department as weird little guys with wires. So sometimes technical abilities and great customer service doesn't always go hand in hand. Well, we've got that with Sean. Now, John can certainly connect up any wires. That's what you need him to do. But he also has the ability to connect with people. Uh, after observing Sean's excellent customer service skills on the help desk, we decided to give him more responsibility with these virtual commission and board meetings. I overheard one board member say to him, I am a non-technical person living in a technology world, and it's very frustrating. But to me, that's where Sean really shines. He has a very calm demeanor, and he'll patiently assist the board members through whatever technical process is necessary for them to be able to join the meetings. Sean also conducted a successful training with the members of the city clerk's office and the development services department so that they too could better support these virtual meetings. I received numerous compliments from those that attended, and in fact, they are the ones that nominated Sean for this award. 
And I'm very pleased that Shaw's performance is being recognized by employees outside of IT. Of course, I'm very glad he decided to join our team this past year. He continues to exceed our expectations. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Emily, Ebony to do the honor. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Stacy. So Sean, because of your wonderful service, the city, the mayor and commissioners would like to present you with this award. And you will also be getting eight hours of paid time off. Thank you so much for your service and congratulations. Thank you so much. Good job. Uh, and, I just want uh, yes, go ahead. No, I just want to say it's a pleasure working with such a great group of people, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, and and it's great. I, I wish I had, well, I, I kind of have somebody like you around me a lot. Uh, my kids, <laughs> they're the ones who straighten me out with respect to uh, the IT issues that I, uh, that I have at home, but uh, you guys are great here in helping us all out, and we really appreciate it. Well-deserved. Thank you. Okay, so we're moving on to um, resolution number 47-21. This is pretty special, and I'm going to read it into the record. This is a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, recognizing and commending Amy Brown for 30 years of service to the City of Delray Beach. Whereas Amy Brown began her career with the City of Delray Beach on February 11th, 1991, and on February 11th, 2021 reached a milestone in her career, having achieved 30 years of full-time service with the city. And whereas Amy was hired as a communication specialist in the police department, where she currently serves with honor and distinction. She has had a steadfast career in this position, working primarily on the night shift and providing outstanding service to the citizens of Delray Beach when they call 911. Whereas Amy has been commended for her excellent customer service when handling high stress calls and professionalism, patience, and courtesy. She consistently earns high scores on her quality assurance rating. And whereas Amy has often gone above and beyond expectations by finding additional information to help police officers locate persons in need of assistance. Her persistence and diligence have helped officers save lives. And whereas Amy's historical and geographical knowledge has proven invaluable on numerous occasions, being a lifelong, lifelong resident of the city. And whereas the city of Delray Beach and the police department are honored to have, have had Amy Brown as a valued member of the municipal team for the past 30 years. She is greatly appreciated by her coworkers and the entire city staff. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the city commission of the city of Delray Beach, Florida as follows, section one, that the city commission of the city of Delray Beach hereby recognizes and commends Amy Brown for 30 years of dedicated and faithful public service. And section two, that the city commission hereby congratulates and expresses sincere thanks and appreciation to Amy Brown for her many years of service and wishes her the best of health and happiness in her continued employment. Passed and adopted in regular session on this second day of March, 2021. Congratulations and thank you. So did anyone want to say anything on behalf? Yes, ma'am. Please yes, go right ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dot Bass Human Resources, we are honored to be here to celebrate Amy's 30 years of service. And I'm happy to say that the chief is here to speak on her behalf. Fantastic. Hello, Mayor, Commission, uh, Lynn, City Manager, hello. Um, Amy Brown has been with this agency as a communication specialist for the past 30 years. That means she has had the life of the officers and the community in her hands for the past 30 years. And let me say, she has done an amazing job. Uh, she receives information on a regular basis. She has to disseminate that information uh, to the officers and send officers on calls for services as well. And what's crazy about this whole situation, all that has to be done simultaneously, all at the same time. So that takes a, 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 you know, a crazy, miraculous skill set to be able to, to get that done. But she has stood above and beyond uh, 
in her performances. And I have nothing but accolades to uh, say about uh, Amy. But on a lighter note, some, day, some mornings I'm sitting in my office, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden a knock on the door. And I look up, and it's Amy standing at the front at my office door with a smile on her face after working all night. How she does it, I have no idea. But she does it with a smile on her face. So, Amy, thank you. Well, job well done. Uh, we truly appreciate you here. Uh, you. Not only in the uh, city of Delray, but the Delray Beach Police Department. I truly appreciate everything you've done. Thank you. And continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief. And we have a uh, we have a plaque for Amy here to hang on her retirement wall when she finally does leave us, and of course the um, copy of her resolution. So thank you so much, commissioners, for um, this honor. Thank Absolutely. You, Amy, would you like to say anything? Not really, but thank you all for your time. <laughs> Listen, I want to say thank you so much for the dedication that you have given to this city over the years, and that. You have really gone um, beyond, it, it sounds like, with what we have heard here today um, with being able to really assist in life-saving uh, situations. And it makes this city, um, you know, feel safer knowing that you're the one that's answering those calls in late at night when somebody's really in desperate need. And so, Amy, thank you so much for your service to the city. We appreciate thank it. You. Thank ahead. you. Thank you. Okay, we have a long overdue resolution to somebody that I think holds a very special place in most of all of our hearts, um, Mr. Zach Strong and, and his untimely passing. So I'm gonna read the proclamation and this was timed for the fact that he was um, involved in the Let's Move legendary um, uh, walk that the city uh, has done um, in, in the in the, uh, in the month of March. So we are going to go ahead and, and read the proclamation into the record. Whereas Alfred Zach Strong was born and raised in Delray Beach and spent a lifetime living and working in the city. He attended Carver High School and later matriculated to the Thune Cookman College in Daytona Beach, Florida where he earned a bachelor's degree. And whereas Mr. Strong was an accomplished and well-respected individual who served this community as a funeral home operator, a softball coach, an activist, a Sunday school teacher at Greater Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church, Delray Beach Masonic Lodge member, and a chairman of the city of Delray Beach's Human Re Relations Board. And whereas Mr. Strong served as president of the South Palm Beach County National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, from 1981 to 1991. He organized protests to advocate for racial and economic justice. And on August 20, 2000, he received a key to the city of Delray Beach for his heroic acts, exemplary leadership, and dedicated dedication to serving God and his community. And whereas Mr. Strong organized the annual Keith Strong Feed the Hungry Thanksgiving, excuse me, Thanksgiving Drive in honor of his late son, which provides food for about 5,000 residents each year. Mr. Strong was also recognized as a distinguished man of excellence by the Delta Heritage Foundation and was honored by the Palm Beach, Palm Healthcare Foundation for his inspiration of Let's Move Legendary Award, which led to its annual Let's Move Walk. And whereas Mr. Strong poured his heart into the community, even in his 90s, he continued to lead the Let's Move Walk each year. And whereas Mr. Strong was well-known, well-liked, highly regarded, respected, beloved, caring, selfish, selfless, and social, a socially active member of the South Florida and Palm Beach County communities, and the city of Delray Beach expresses deep sorrow over Mr. Strong's transition on March 3rd, I'm mean, sorry, excuse me, on December 3rd, 2020. Now, therefore, I, Shelley Petrolia, Mayor of the City of Delray Beach, on behalf of the City Commission, do hereby proclaim that the second Sunday of March each year with forthwith shall be known and recognized as Alfred Zach Strong Day. Now granted in good faith, honor, and respect for Mr. Alfred Zach Strong, a man whose life was dedicated to serving the City of Delray Beach with love 
and sincerity to the strong family and those who uh -huh. loved whose lives he touched. And I have assigned the seal of the city and my signature to a plaque that we will, uh, that we will a, pro a proclamation that we will give to the family. So I'm sorry that they're not here to receive it, but we'll get it to them. So thank you very much. All right, so we are going to move on to one more. <clears throat> and if you give me just one second, I'll be right Wait, back. You're here. Madam Mayor. Yes. We do have someone from the Strawn family there in the room. Oh, so. fantastic. I'll, I'll go right over right now. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm so, I appreciate that. I wasn't, I wasn't notified. Thank you so much. We weren't aware that you were going to be here. Oh, yes. so we just wanted to make sure that we presented this to you. All right. And we have actually affixed a day in the, in the city of Delray Beach mm -hmm. so that every single year we'll know that Mr. Alfred Zach Strong's day is this day every single year going going forward. So oh. thank you so much. Thank you. And we we know that uh, we are, our sincere condolences and Everybody misses that strong. Yeah, yeah, we all Wonderful do. Man. We Wonderful all do. Man. Did you want to say anything? Uh, yes. I'm on behalf of my my father. Um, mm. He always liked to say that. Talk about Delray Beach. My dad loved Delray Beach. When he was a youth, the time how bad it was between blacks and white, up to now, racial equality is much better now. Dad was a, he was a pioneer to love everyone. He just that type of person. And on behalf of my family, that I promised my dad that although he gone home in glory now, but I was filling his shoes. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank right. you for coming in. Thank, thank, you. thank you for saying that too. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. It's a pleasure. Thank you. They had a video tribute that they wanted to play. Should we play that now? Or? Okay, so we have one more. <laughs> we, we're busy. <laughs> I have a great uh, um, proclamation that I'm going to read into the record for, um, <clears throat> for Atlantic High School Eagles football team. This is very exciting. Okay, so whereas... History was made for the Atlantic High School football team within the city of Delray Beach. Atlantic High School is distinguished by holding the 2020 Class 7A Tri-County Gold Level Championship title. Whereas during 2020 season, the team averaged 45 points a game. Hard work, dedication, focus, and teamwork is what makes the Atlantic High School Eagles excel both on and off the football field. And whereas the strong leadership ability of Atlantic High School's former coach, football coach, T.J. Jackson, exemplifies dedication and determination leading to the Eagles' seven straight winning seasons and the 2020 Tri-County Championship. Coach Jackson developed a comprehensive football program that encompassed athletics and academics. He inspired many students, staff members, and parents during, the time, during that, his time at Atlantic High School. And whereas the team has an impressive 66 to 16 record win and the Sam Brodnick Coach of the Year Award presented to the top high school football coach in Palm Beach County in 2015. And whereas Atlantic High School's football program is centered around a rigorous academic focus, including daily SAT and ACT preparation and college readiness, and encourages the students to excel as leaders in the community. And now, therefore, I, Shelley Petrolia, Mayor of the City of Delray Beach, on behalf of the City Commission, do hereby recognize and congratulate Atlantic High School's football team and coaches for an amazing championship season and a job well done. May you continue to have supportive school administrators who believe that kids come first. And I have my seal of approval and I'm going to hand this off to Principal Tara. 
Here thank we go. You. Compost. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Would you like to say anything? I would love to. Thank Fantastic. You. You said a lot yours. here, but I appreciate it. Thank you, you Mayor. It. Thank you to the City Commission of Delray Beach, Florida. I also want to thank Chief Sims and his team, the community, my staff, our parents, and our supporters for all that you do to make this program truly what it has become. We are an Atlantic Community Eagle family, and we can't do what we do by ourselves. It truly takes a village, and I thank you. I appreciate your continued support. I'm very proud of my kids, both on and off the football field, and we're going to continue the same rigorous program academically and athletically. Nothing's changing except a different coach, which we promoted our assistant coach to head coach. And we're very excited for another great football season ahead of us in the upcoming year. So come out and support us. Go Eagles. If I didn't know better, I'd think that you were the leader of the cheerleading squad. <laughs> I get excited when I talk about my kids. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. Thank really, you so much for coming in. Appreciate and it. And on behalf of Coach Jackson, we thank you for all that you do for us. Fabulous. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll be right back. What do you see? Sorry. Thank you. Good to see you. where we're at. Hold on just a second. I believe we are now at the, uh, is there anything that anybody wants to say? I didn't see any hands up. So just in case we're good. Looks like we're good to go. Um, comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda items. Mayor, from the Mayor, I'm sorry. I couldn't get my hand up fast enough. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, Deputy right. Vice Mayor, you have the floor. Yes. Go right ahead. There was so, there was so much more uh, Principal Tara could have said to tell us about the team. We, um, I didn't realize that Coach TJ was given Coach of the um, County Year. Award, Year. and that our senior uh, quarterback was also given, uh, I don't know, a statewide award. The the entire team made first all team this, all, all team that. So it's a wonderful team. I'd like everyone to come out and support the next um, year, and good luck to, to Coach Stewart. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Seeing no one, we're going to move on to the public uh, the comments. We're going to start with city manager's response for prior public comments, if there are any. Ms. Alvarez, no. Okay. Moving, moving to public comments. Ms. Kateri, do we have any um, recorded? No, ma'am, we do not have any public comments. That's surprising. Okay, very good. So um, we have uh, consent agenda then approval. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Okay, moving on to 7A, ratification for emergency regulations for COVID-19. This Any is just a ratification of the 47th, 48th, and 49th extensions. Motion to approve. Any Thank you. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Okay, moving on to 7B, nomination for appointment from the Downtown uh, Development Authority. And this goes to Commissioner Cassell, I believe. Mayor, thank you. Mayor, before Commissioner Cassell makes her appointment, um, Ms. Simon contacted the city earlier today. And just for clarification, this is for an unexpired term that's going to end July of 2021. So it's not for a full three year term. Right. Thank you for that. I don't know if that makes any difference for Commissioner Cassell. I don't believe it does. Um, I would like to nominate Mark Denkler. Second. Okay, thank you. We've got a nomination a second. Any conversation or concerns? Seeing none, call the roll. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Double yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Moving on to resolution number 44 21. And this would be Ms. Johnson, I guess. I have down I, for 
No, I'm sorry. I'm Kateri Johnson. Kateri Johnson. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I think I this usually, is actually. I usually, yeah. I usually say Miss Kateri so that I don't get you guys, you know, everybody answering the same question. But anyway, did, were you going to handle this, uh, Miss Kateri? Mayor, this is this is the street renaming for Delray Medical. All right, this is. Hey, um, sorry, I couldn't get the ball <laughs> to pass to me. Um, All right, so. Antia, you're up. We've got it. Okay, so uh, this Thanks. is actually a privately initiated request by Delray Medical uh, to rename a street that is currently known as Bryan Boulevard. And the applicants are here to make a presentation. It's either, uh, they're all here. I think John Segreto, um, Maggie Gill, and Lisa Cook. Um, so I'm not sure who we're going to unmute, but um, they will give you an overview of their request and I'll follow up really quickly with the technicality. Fantastic. Are they on Zoom then? Or are they on the, um, they've been they, called in? Yes. They are here and they are onboarded. So if we could okay. just unmute, if maybe raise your little hand so IT can find you quickly in the list. So we have John and Lisa and uh, Maggie. Yeah, John's the okay. now. Great. Mr. Secreto, can you hear us? Good afternoon, everyone. There you go. Great. Yes, I can. You hear me? Perfect. Okay, great. So I'd like to start by just thanking uh, the city of Delray Beach for considering this request to rename Bryan Boulevard to Heroes Way. A um, little background over the last year, we've witnessed the overwhelming, <clears throat> excuse me, compassion, dedication, perseverance, and strength of our employees, physicians, and first responders. We felt that renaming Bryan Boulevard to Heroes Way would be a fitting tribute to the many healthcare heroes that we have. Um, and also every time that they pull into our campus, it's a reminder of them of how much their sacrifice and their dedication is appreciated during uh, the pandemic and every day. Thank you. Thank you, Anthea. Or did, did um, Ms. Cook or Ms. Gill want to speak? I, guess. I don't hear anything. I'll take it if that's okay, Mr. Secretary. Maggie, um, I'm uh, I'm sorry, sorry. Um, Mayor. I, I'm here representing um, our CEO, Maggie. She could not be here, so I'm here. Oh, okay. Okay. Very good. And Ms. Cook is okay to so just let us go ahead and turn it back over to Anthea. Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you so All much. Right. <laughs> All right. So um, this is actually the road. Um, that you can see on the map in front of you. It's a private road, meaning that is, it is um, a private road within the body of the campus and it connects Linton Boulevard to uh, Military Trail. It's currently known as Bryan Boulevard. Um, and um, staff has analyzed the request. There are no addressing issues that result from the name change as the medical center um, you know, owns both sides of the road at this point. Um, there are no issues that would create any kind of um, impact to first responders. And the code of ordinances simply requires that uh, the um, city planning board make a recommendation and then the city commission, it is your uh, determination, to, your final determination to designate the names. And you don't technically have to follow what the planning and zoning board says in this case, but you um, should know that they, um, they um, overwhelmingly supported their request and voted five to zero to recommend approval of the name change. And that's it. Thank you very much. To the commission, if uh, there's no discussion, I'm 100% behind it, but uh, I imagine everybody else is too. So entertain a motion. To approve. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Very good. Thank you so much, Mr. Secreto, for coming and uh, telling us about this and, and making this recommendation. I think it's a great idea. Thank you very much for your approval. We're greatly appreciative. Got it. Okay, we've got a hand up somewhere for some reason. Podium. Try to get in now. All right, I'm not going to worry about it. Moving on to the city uh, merit pay increase. This is a 7D. City attorney, I'm sorry, merit pay increase, 7D. Hi. Hi, yes, Mayor Dwayne DeAndre, can you hear me? You can. 
All right, very good. I'm here uh, to uh, talk about the merit increase for the city attorney. As you all know, I forwarded you the performance evaluation that we do annually for the city attorney's position. I did receive all of them back from the mayor and commissioners. Um, the, the performance evaluation is a score from one to five, and that would be the merit increase. And the average score totaled out of the ones that all the ones that you submitted was 4.85. So up for your consideration is a 4.85% merit increase for our city attorney, Ms. Jellin. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I don't recall ever seeing a score as high as this, um, just just in the time frame that I've been um, uh, sitting as a uh, an elected official. And I think it's uh, it's it's uh, certainly um, warranted and it's deserved. So I am uh, interested in making sure that we do a merit pay, pay increase. And um, uh, I'm going to open up the floor to anybody who has a suggestion. And it looks like, uh, Commissioner Frankel, you have your hand up first. You are recognized. Sure, thank you. Um, I absolutely think uh, Lynn deserves this merit increase of 4.85%. Uh, not only has she done an amazing job, but she has assembled a team that I think is second to none. Uh, the, the city legal department has improved immensely since uh, I became a city commissioner again three years ago. And she's stabilized that position. She has a great team behind her. And if there's something out of the realm uh, that is above or a different subject matter that's not within her purview, she has found the outside counsel uh, that has certainly been more than capable. And I, I point to Mr. Khan and the year over a year long work they did on the panhandling ordinance, just as an example. So uh, I am absolutely in support. And Lynn, you and your team, uh, you know, thank you so much. You guys just do an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Deputy Vice Mayor. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I just want to um, echo what Commissioner Franco just stated. I cannot imagine working with anyone other than Ms. Jellin since she has uh, assumed the lead position as our city attorney. I am so pleased and so happy. Congratulations, Lynn, and thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, anyone else? All right. Uh, um, Commissioner, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor? Well, I, I, just, want to, uh, I just want to add that uh, Ms. Jellin is an incredible resource. Uh, as a commissioner in uh, in Delray Beach, I can't imagine not having her. I think she's in my top top five, like T-Mobile top five. I think it's uh, you know my my wife, my son, maybe my mom and dad, and then there's Lynn Jell in there. Um, so, so uh, but I can't imagine. Uh, you, Lynn. <laughs> I can't imagine doing this, and in, and in, in probably the only thing I could say to her is hopefully that we can make her job even easier because I think she has to navigate some political waters and. Uh, a little too often. So um, hopefully we can do that for you, Lynn, and congratulations. Absolutely. Um, okay, so um, I, I, I know I'm probably guilty of the reason that you got an 8 point, I mean, 4.85 and not a 5.0. <laughs> can, 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 I, can I make the suggestion that we bring her up 5% 5, 5 instead of 4.85%? Would we be okay with that? Because I, I just feel, yeah, okay, we've got, we've got three. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that we do that, um, Actually, Commissioner yeah. Castell. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Yeah, I was raising my hand, not saying it. I only the only thing I think we ought to consider is uh, under very similar or the same circumstances, we gave an increase to uh, CRA director of six percent. So I'm thinking perhaps we should look at six percent as opposed to five. Up, up to the committee. Can someone run by the policy for me on these ratings? And, and I've, I've questioned this in the past, how these ratings for city staff um, connect to the actual raise that's given. What's the city policy for that? Can I, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay, yes. Yeah. So uh, the, the rating system that we have, uh, Commissioner Boylston, is the the one that you did for Ms. Jellin is the same one that we do for all city staff. Zero to five, they're rated on competency levels, just like you did here with Ms. Jellin. Ms. Jellin. And then it's divided by the amount of numbers of questions that you answered there. So um, it's the same sort of format for Ms. Jellin for all other employees. Um, and that's what you entertained here today. 
And for other employees, is whatever that score ends up being, is that the raise that they are provided? Yes, sir. Okay, I, I would, I'd be in favor of staying with our, our, our city policy. Um, if we want to address that policy in the future, I would love to have a question, you know, would love to discuss that. Cause I do, I do think uh, it's not a great policy just to equate that score to the exact, you know, percentage raise that you get. Um, it's kind of, in my opinion, an antiquated way of, uh, of rating or rewarding uh, associates. So, uh, but for now, I'd like to stay with the city. Okay, I didn't hear what you said at the very end. I would like to stick. I would like to stick with okay. city policy. Got it. Okay. Anyone else? I I didn't quite understand what that meant. Does that Stay mean that four point eight five? Four point eight five instead of five. Are we going to vote on that? You can, or you can make a motion for something different, uh, Deputy Vice Mayor. I'm 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 in agreement that it should be five. Okay, make a motion then, please. I'd like to make a motion that we grant um, City Attorney Lynn Jellen a 5.0 five, um, percent, 5 rating for a 5% increase. Is that the right way to say it? Good enough. I think Good we enough. got it. Second? Second. Okay, call the, call the roll, please. Mr. Boston? No. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolius? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Congratulations, Ms. Um, Jellin. Well deserved. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. We'll, we'll make that happen. Thanks, Mayor. You got it. Okay, moving on to public comment, or I'm sorry, public hearing. Um, ordinance no. number 53 dash. Mayor, Mayor, we skipped oh. item 7E. Oh, I, I am so sorry. You are correct. Okay, going backwards. Uh, 7E, discussion and direction concerning uh, local rules. And this would be Ms. Ms. Jellin. So now you're going to earn your case. Now you're going to earn yeah, your right? <laughs> I purposely put this on this agenda sorry. for that reason. <laughs> no, and first, yeah, I do want to say, I want to say thank you to all of you. I did, I did read your evaluations and I, you know, I love my job and don't tell my husband, what, but I would do it for free because I love this job. So don't tell me. <laughs> Um, okay, so discussion and direction concerning the local rules. As promised, I did a complete rewrite of the local rules um, for a few reasons. Number one, I think that um, rules are a good thing. Policies are a good things. They guide our actions and our behavior. And number two, I think it gives the public um, notice as to what's expected and notice as to um, how the city government is going to proceed. So just very quickly, just to give you um, just some of the changes that I make very made very quickly. Um, some of these may require an LDR change, so I do need to have a little bit of a discussion with you about it. For example, uh, for workshops, I am proposing that prior to any privately initiated um, tax amendments to our land development regulations, that um, and this is done in other in other. Uh, municipalities and um, cities. Um, Ms. Alvarez can speak to it. I know she has experience with it. But typically, somebody from the commission would have to sponsor the legislation. So what would happen is before it can even go through the city process and take up staff time, somebody would have to um, come up uh, before you during a workshop, and they would have to almost pitch it to the commission and see if there's anybody who's interested in such legislation. If they can't get the sponsorship of at least one commissioner, then the item would fail and it would end there. I think this is important for a few reasons. Number one, it saves staff time. So staff isn't spending a lot of time preparing an agenda item, a staff report, and doing all the research necessary to bring it before a lower board, to bring it before you, only to have it denied at first reading because it's not something that the commission wishes to consider at that particular time. So I do think um, it's something novel that we haven't tried here before. Um, but that one would actually take a little bit of time to implement because I would have to do a, a change to the LDRs just to make them a little bit more clear in order to um, require that sponsorship. So that's one item that I did uh, propose to change. Um, the next item that's that I changed was for on page eight, first and second readings. So once an item comes before you for first reading, um, the city of Boca Raton does this. First reading is just reading the caption 
in the commission discussion and either the commission moves it to second reading or it fails at first reading, but there's no presentation. As you know, right now, the way that things are, are considered, we actually have two presentations that typically don't have a lot of time limitations on them and they can take up a lengthy uh, portion of our agenda. So my, my um, recommendation on that would be to simply um, move it along on first reading and for second reading, if it's privately initiated or staff initiated, that's where the presentation would occur and the conversations can be had. Also on that page, um, I did put a 10 minute maximum on, on public hearings. So these are not your quasi judicial proceedings. These are just public hearings um, that are heard by the commission and there would be a 10 minute limit on those. Um, obviously rules, you know, we, we can change the rules if it's necessary. If somebody needed an additional minute or two, I can't imagine that the commission would deny such a request. But again, these rules really give the public and the applicants a little bit more clarity as to what the expectations are when they appear before this commission. On page 10, um, I did add to the portion of commission appointments um, when we had the workshop discussing, um, you know, whether current board members could apply for open vacancies on other boards. So I did put a notation in there that no application for appointment would be considered for current board member whose term has not yet expired. And that was a clear direction from the commission at one of your workshops. On page 13, under a lot of time. So this is a little bit of a change. Um, I don't know how you're gonna feel about it, but for those meetings where you have more than 20 people um, that desire to speak on the same topic, the there would be a 60 minute time limit. So essentially three minutes, 20 people, that's where the 60 minutes comes from. Um, again, if you felt there's only three more people that would love to speak and you wanted to hear what they had to say, you could always enlarge that. But as a guiding principle, 20 people would be permitted to speak. And then after that, it would be at the discretion of the commission. Um, on page 15, I memorialized, um, we've already been doing this. It's been a policy of the commission, but the commissioner attendance by telephone. So we had the situation where um, I believe it was Commissioner Frankel who was out of town and we had an emergency proceeding. The commission found that there was an emergency. There was a physical quorum in the room and we were able to proceed allowing Commissioner Frankel to attend um, by phone. So that's essentially, I'm just memorializing what you've already been doing. Um, on the same page, page 15, I added a section on Commissioner Decorum and Civility. I took your comments from our workshop and I just memorialized those into this, this, um, this document. So that's essentially all the changes that I made. Um, it is a much lengthier document than you've seen. Um, Ms. Alvarez reviewed it and provided me with her feedback. And um, I think these are changes that I, I think are necessary based on what we've seen. Um, and so I welcome your comments. I, I have a question for you just, just real quick about the allotted time. Um, you said that there uh, you would only allow for 60 minutes. In other words, like for instance, um, that would be basically 20 people of um, using all three minutes or more if there was less time used. Um, what happens to those that don't get to speak? Is it just that they're SOL and, and we just cut, cut it off at that point? Or how does that work? And, and, and is, that, is that infringing on someone's right to speak at, in, a, in a meeting? I think it, I think essentially it would, be, it would almost be like a case by case basis. But if you're, if you're seeing, for example, people come in wearing the same shirt. So you're pretty much clear on what they're going to say and what their take is on a project or application before you. I think you can say fairly that, you know, we've heard the same comment from, you know, the same group of people, you know, we hear you. And I, I, I don't think that would be infringing. And again, these are time, place, and manner restrictions. They're not content related. So we're not saying, you know, you get 10 people for and 10 people against, and that's it. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that the first 20 people get to speak. And again, you know, I think we have to always be flexible with the rules in this regard. And that if the commission or a commissioner feels, you know what, I think we should hear from the rest of the people. I think it would be fair to say, you know what, in this situation, we're gonna open it up to let everybody speak. But if it's a situation where, and we've seen this unfortunately, where the same people are reading the same script and it's over and over and over again, I think under those circumstances, I don't think it's unfair to limit the comment, um, understanding, you know, citing these rules. Well, um, you know, my concern is that you have people who are trying to get to, let's say, a meeting or whatever, and and are late in coming, and uh, 
you know, and that you have a front loading in of all one, you know, one issue or one one side of an issue in order to be able to, you know, kind of lean in one direction or, or have just the entire uh, conversation lean in one direction, you may end up losing um, the second half of the, you know, of those. I, I just, I worry about that one. Uh, I'm just going to be frank with you. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I, I'm with everybody else, you know, three hours of hearing the same thing is not not enjoyable for anybody and it and it certainly does eat into everybody's time so i think but i i know that we could we could overstep it and just open it up and i guess that's what you're saying here so I, i'm okay with it i just wanted to kind of talk about that okay i'm sorry i didn't see whose name went up first whose name who okay and julie, if i could just add one more thing oh, yeah. i i had also considered um and i know that i've seen this in other municipalities and it's really more when we go to the live meetings but there are some municipalities that do a public comment at the beginning of the meeting and then a public comment at the end. And I did, I was going to recommend that as well. I know this commission has discussed that before, especially when you went to the four o'clock meetings. And I don't think that that's, um, you know, something negative. I think that could be something very positive, especially, you know, for the people who wanted to come to a meeting and can't come at four o'clock because they work. We could always add that to the agenda at the end of the meeting to afford people who arrive late an opportunity to speak. That's a great idea. I like that idea. Okay, Commissioner uh, Cassell. Thanks. Um, two questions, Attorney Jellin. On the allotted time, how do we handle phone calls? I mean, we've been in meetings with hundreds of phone calls, and then there are also people in person. Will that apply to the people that call in for public comment as well? Well, I mean, I'm hoping that at some point the pandemic does come to an end and we can all sit in the same room together. Um, but again, as long as we're not restricting the content of the speech and, you know, we can make it 90 minutes if you wanted to, you know, we could do that. We can enlarge the time for a lot of time for public comment. But um, yes, you could say, you know, we're going to have a hard stop at, you know, five o'clock with the comments and then we're going to proceed. So you can absolutely do that. And remember, you know, the public always has other means of communicating their thoughts to you. So, you know, the public right. could also be encouraged to send emails and, and things of, of that nature in order to communicate with um, with with the commission. Uh, this isn't set in stone. So if, if you directed me to say, you know what, let's do 90 minutes and, you know, 30 comments, 30 people, we could do that as well. We can take it out. But I know that we've had these situations where, you know, it's, it's the same comment, you know, and it's just, you know, strength in numbers, right? But the commission is aware of it. You know, you're aware of the people that are making the comments and their position, and it just becomes repetitive at some point. So, um, just so you know, I, you know, this is not my complete work product. I did look at other municipalities and counties in order to come up with this, and this is actually Palm Beach County. So, this is their, you know, I modeled ours after theirs. So, the county has this, but they also do have um, two opportunities for public comment as well. Fantastic. Great. Okay. Thank you. And then may I ask one more question as well? Um, I love the workshop item. You know that we've spoken about this before, but I'm just wondering why we opted for one commissioner rather than a majority or two, because it seems like if the goal is to save time and not have applications come through, that we ultimately may not consider having one commissioner agree may not really benefit us greatly, if I may. You know what, to be honest, I kind of wanted to keep the bar low because, you know, we do want to sometimes with privately initiated items, there are some things that staff is considering, but we just don't have the bandwidth to address. And when it's privately initiated, you know, that that person is able to move it along faster. So I didn't want to set the bar as high as requiring majority. You could say sponsorship of two commissioners, but, I, you know, I would probably say you maybe not three. Because you you don't want to impede the process, you know. Change is sometimes a good thing, and you know you. I don't know if I would do three. I would probably do one or two, and then you know, see see how that works. Almost test it out. I think it's also interesting just that you know you're having no uh, presentation required at the first read as well, which is the point at which your majority could come into play with something that is a, um, you know, privately initiated, uh, you know, amendment or whatever we're doing at the time. So I think that, you know, that one or two, I, I think one is fine just because we, and there's also the question of 
I know that you wouldn't be um, breaching sunshine as long as you've got the two parties that are totally separated, but um, coming together and talking about it at that first read, a lot of times will encourage people to either go forward or not, you know? So I think that it's good to get together and have that conversation as long as there's one person, because we've actually ended up in a situation where there was nobody interested in it. And there was so much work done on that particular, you know, issue, and there was no interest on any from any of the commissioners, and that's a shame on all accounts, including the, um, uh, the, um, you know, the, the applicant. Okay, so moving. Uh, did you have your questions answered, Ms. Cassell? Okay, so moving on, Commissioner Frankel. Yes, thank you. Um, I was going to bring up the same issue. Um, I also think it's a great idea for having uh, sponsorship. But I also think it should be by two, just in the case that you may have one rogue commissioner in the future that could put a million things on there and it may just burden uh, staff. Whereas if at least you get two, you don't have a sole voice trying to push things along. So I, I, I just, I would feel a little bit better about two on that matter. And then other than that, you guys did a great job. I mean, it's uh, no easy task. I know it's been worked on for months and, and maybe that's why Lynn, your department got such a great rave review today. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. But other than that, I, I just think too, I don't know if there's support, but that would be my only comment as of now. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bolson. Yeah, my question on the, on the sponsorship, like you said, Mayor, I can only think of maybe one or two times where something went through the entire process. I mean, the, is Ms. Jellin, is there a reason we were adding this? Because I don't see many projects that make its way through. It's, you know, if the applicant doesn't have the support and pushes through, shame on them. They should be meeting with us individually and know whether or not, you know, they, they have the votes to move forward. Are there a lot that die very far into the process, but not far enough to where we see it? Is that what we're trying to correct? Um, I, I, I don't think, I don't think, I would say a lot. I think we're just trying to be more proactive. Um, I think we're just trying to bring things before the commission before they go down a road. And as you know, um, and as, especially recently, we've had a situation where things get all the way up to your level and then the commission's not, you know, doesn't have an appetite for it. And then it's going back to planning and zoning. And it's just, it's, it's just creating a lot of back and forth where I think that if at the very onset, the commission is giving the direction of what they would like to see either, and it's almost like um, in the lower board, they do something called concept plan review. So basically you come before historic preservation board, you come before uh, site plan review board and you pitch your concept and you kind of, you're testing the waters and you're testing the waters before number one, you spend the, the money on an application and you're seeing, you know, if, if this is even gonna be a go, because as you know, the process to get to an application is expensive. And then there's a lot, it's very time consuming and it's a lengthy process. So I think staff and, you know, this was not just done, you know, unilaterally by me. This was done very collectively with Ms. Alvarez and Anthea. And I think just seeing how other municipalities are streamlining um, things that come before the commission, things that even come before the lower boards. I just think, um, you know, it gives the applicant I'm not going to use the word assurances because that's not what it's going to do, but at least it, it's testing the waters and giving them a temperature to say, you know what, should we invest in this and, and move forward? Or maybe now is not the right time for this, or maybe we should tweak it based on what the commission is saying they would like to see. One example is the railroad corridor that's going to be on tonight's agenda. You know, you heard it, you know, and I know that you meet with the applicants well in advance and you have engaging discussions. But when you were when it came before us the last time for first reading, you were very quick to say, you know, I'm not going to consider this with the automated parking. That's got to be removed. So that would have been something that probably when it was workshopped, you probably would have said something like, listen, I wouldn't even consider that at this point. Your colleagues would have may or may not have given consensus. And then it would have streamlined that item so that it's not something that now we're debating. OK, well, now it's, it went for second reading but it didn't have that. So now does it have to go to a lower board? I think it just makes things easier. It gives people more direction, more clarity, and it gives them a little bit of an understanding of what the commission is looking for because we're, staff can't give you the, that guidance, right? 
you know, we can tell you what the LDR say. We can tell you how we interpret it. And, you know, we don't even make recommendations anymore. So at least they're getting somewhat of a nod from at least one or two people, depending on how I draft this or, you know, what the direction is to say, you know what, I, I like this, you know, I could see this and I might consider it even more if it has X, Y, and Z. So again, you know, you can do one, you can do none, you can tell me to leave it alone. I think we were just trying to brainstorm ideas to, to just make our meetings more productive and make them so that what's coming before you is really something that's been vetted, really something that is good for the community that everybody wants to get that 5-0, right, when they come before you. So, you know, starting from the onset and, and kind of getting everybody to weigh in, that's, you know, that's going to make it easier for someone when they when they come in for their first or second reading. Well, I'll tell you why I like it. Um, I have these meetings. I have these meetings I've, over the last three years with a lot of projects that immediately get a absolutely not response and then we never hear from them again and they're usually people from outside of Delray bringing projects that are just never going to happen for our city so I think this would bring those those meetings out so the public can see how many projects are brought to our city and are killed way 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 early on by not even having any support whatsoever so um, I think that would be great because I, I I think there's even even members of our our commission that don't get to see all those projects because you're right I do meet with everybody. And uh, if I could put, you know, if I could minimize those meetings so they come in front of us with the process, I'd appreciate that. So I, I, I'm in favor of that. I think one's one's fine. If there's best practice out there that you can show me that's two, I haven't heard of that. I haven't heard of, of, of two. So I rather start with, you know, best practice from other uh, municipalities. Um, my other my, my concern, I'm not limiting how many people. Um, can can come and speak. Yes, we've been seen like a lot because you can just make a phone call right now. But once we go back to in person, I don't think we're going to have that problem. And I am not telling the city of Delray Beach that the first 20 people can speak on that. Um, I, I wouldn't put anything in place because I'll always make the exception. I'll always say, let the rest talk, let the rest speak. So for me, that's uh, that's not something I would like to see. And then under um, commissioner decorum and civility, I really would like this section to be a little bit, you know, more built out, but definitely the communication sent in any official capacity containing personal views should include a disclaimer. So stating, um, I, I think, I think you need to put what that statement is and where that statement needs to be. Is there a consensus for that? Mr. Johnson saying yes. Okay. I could, I could draft something and send it around. Great. Thank you. Um, are were we going to add anything about about social media? Um, I thought I did, but if I didn't, um, I'll, I'll left. Go ahead. Well, the social media discussion was was really geared towards number one, the public records aspect, and you know yeah. who's going to be maintaining your official pages. Obviously, you know, from my <clears> position, <throat> I would say that our PIO or somebody in that department should maintain those pages. And anything that is posted on your official pages, not campaign pages, not personal pages, right. anything that's posted on the official pages is subject to review and approval by the Office of the PIO. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, I, I hesitate, you know, sometimes you feel like if you put too much, then it's, it's the obvious, right? Like I shouldn't have to tell somebody that they have to follow a policy, right? They should know this. We're adults. We know we have to follow the rules and regulations. So, you know, a part of me thinks that when you start getting too nuanced in what you can and cannot do, then then it when you have an exception, then, well, there wasn't in the policy. So, you know, I, I try to keep it more broad and more um, easier to understand and follow. If the commission's direction is to make it more clear, I really just took the slides that I presented to you at that meeting and just put them into this document. Really about social media. And just so my colleagues know, after that workshop, um, I exported my entire commissioner Facebook um, and all the data and information. I gave it to Lynn and put it on the record and I shut down my page because I, that's what I thought their appropriate thing was to do. Um, I think we do need something uh, in there in regards to actions on social media in an official capacity. 
I don't, I don't have any problem with uh, adding that. I mean, I mean, we're talking about the official pages. That's correct. I mean, all I really do on my official page is just copy what the city's putting out and just push it out further. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Any, I'll do that social media language. Okay, and you're going to get this back to us anyway, um, with respect yes. to the, the changes that we that were um, um, asked for and uh, supported. Yes. So my 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 goal is that it will be on the agenda at the organizational meeting, and that will be oh. the final draft for approval. Good. Okay, Deputy Vice Mayor, you had your hand up. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to commend uh, Attorney Jellen on the hard work that she has put into this document. And it's to make all of us better as commissioners and to be more respective of each other's time. I commend um, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Boylston because you've been taking the bulk of the work. When there's a new idea, they obviously know to come and pitch it to you because I don't get the, oh, let me tell you what I'd like to do on 13th Street. Um, so I thank you, sir, for that. I like the innovative idea of trying to make sure that we are not utilizing our advisory boards and or our staff in ways that are non-productive because everything costs, whether we like it or not. When you're working on a project that will eventually not receive the approval of the commission, and that's three out of five or four out of five or five out of five, you have wasted so much time, effort, and resources and money. And I believe that it isn't to our benefit to continue in this manner. So again, um, Lynn, thank you so much. I don't know how much copying and pasting you did. Whatever you did, obviously, hopefully you picked the right um, template on which to um, copy. As far as public, once the COVID has ended for our return to quote unquote normal speed, I do like the idea that the public now believes that if we can just get a group of people together, we can go for two and three hours and we can just say the same thing over and over and over again. And they'll have to sit there and listen to us. There can be such a thing as abuse of authority. I, I know because we've all experienced it with the ability to not be able to discern what the telephone calls have all been. And I know that was not before this body, but five of us were in that body and it still resonates with me that if um, we can't control someone saying the same thing over and over again, sometimes not well, and it was more than once, it was not just one particular uh, project, effort, et cetera. But I do think that commissioners can be abused, and I, I commend you for trying to save us and, and protect us from just becoming jaded to not even listening to what the fifth or the sixth person has said, because if you've said it once, you've said it again and again and again, and we're sitting there, but how often are we really tuned in to what the 50th person has said if we know that they're reading from a script, et cetera. So thank you very much for trying to look out for us and, and our mental health. <laughs> thank you. And I, I, Jennifer, did you have your, um, yes, okay. Recognizing Jennifer Alvarez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, really, I just wanted to thank the commission for your input on, in this um, as Ms. Jellin advised this was a collaborative effort and um, she really um, helped us in spearheading some of our suggestions and bringing them forward in this document. Part of it has to do with time management and having efficient meetings and obviously recognizing, as you said, you know, staff um, working hours on end in, in all of these, uh, not just the commission meetings, but advisory boards preparing everything that goes into some of these processes. So um, I just wanted to kind of close it out with a comment, letting you know that a lot of these came from suggestions from staff as well as the attorney's office and commission feedback. So I just wanted to thank you for that and really productive discussion tonight. Fantastic. Well, I think you have your direction, Ms. Jellen. So I think we're good to go, correct? Thank you. 
All right, so now we're moving on to public hearings and we have ordinance uh, 53-20. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances, Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.6, Supplemental District Regulations, Section 4.6.7, Signs, by amending subsection E, Sign Design Standards, and subsection J, Prohibited Signs, to establish regulations allowing certain sign designs to extend into the right-of-way within the Central Business District and Old School Square Historic Arts District, and restructure existing subsections to eliminate inconsistent requirements, providing a conflicts clause, providing a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. Good, Anthea. Uh, good evening, Anthea Genetis, Development Services Director for the record. This is city initiated. Um, there were a couple of minor changes to the ordinance um, as a result of some of the comments at first reading. So I wanted to be sure that um, I went over those with you. And um, just to um, remind everybody that this, this ordinance is um, intended to allow certain signs to um, you know, be located within the public right of way, um, which is particularly um, relevant in the central business district and on the OSHED properties with CBD overlay. And they're really um, geared towards existing buildings that were legally constructed and also arcades. We have existing arcades like hands and we have some new arcades that have come in with recently approved buildings and they extend over the sidewalk. Um, and there are a couple of, of restructuring. And just for the record, I just want to reiterate, there, this does not introduce any new kinds of signs into downtown. It does not increase the number of signs that are currently allowed for business. And it is not changing the size of the signs that are currently allowed. So none of that, it's really um, geared towards um, those um, sort of conditions and particularly in downtown where the sidewalk and the public the public property and the private property do sometimes merge into one holistic design and the invisible line is sometimes on the wrong side. Um, uh, the signage that um, projects into the public right of way or hangs over awnings um, has historically been located within the downtown for years. Um, and it's just as the, the rules have changed where they've sort of not had that uh, um, ability. Um, so here's the change basically between first and second reading is on page six of the ordinance. And um, I believe um, it was um, Commissioner Boylston who had sort of said, well, um, suggested that maybe there should be a threshold of it's okay, but at a certain point, it really does need the review of a lower board. So staff went uh, back um, to the drawing board and um, added um, criteria. Um, so projecting signs, can actually be quite large. They can be up to 30 square feet and they're allowed to protect three feet from the base of the building. And so um, if the sign is quite small, five square feet, so you know, a little bit over two by two and a half feet, um, that would be something that we could administratively approve. But if it got larger than five feet, then it would go to either SCRAB or Historic Preservation Board, depending on which board had purview over the property. And then if it projected more than two feet, even though they're allowed to go three, but if it's projecting more than two feet into the right of way, then at that point, um, again, it would it would circulate through a board um, for review. So that was the change as a result of those comments. Um, there were um, it did require a little bit of restructuring, and, and you know, just because once we address location in one, we 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 move some other text around. But the the only substantive changes are the ones that um, I just went over with you. So um, the required findings are that you determine that the text is consistent with and for the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. And we have gone over a more thorough review on first reading about um, historic preservation um, goals, objectives, and then also streamlining the land development regulations. Um, both HPD and planning board did recommend approval, um, although four to three for both boards and the DDA recommended approval five to zero. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, so anything else that we can just go into discussion? Um, and Anthea, can you just very quickly uh, explain why there was um, the almost split on the HPV and the planning and zoning recommendations? What 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 was the issue there? Do you know? So, so there were there were there was a I think one of the big concerns with this uh, with um, planning and zoning board and and rightly so was that if you look at the review dates, you'll see that Historic Preservation Board saw it after we took it through for public hearing. 
and um, the board, we were trying to un uh, jam the backlog, you know, from having to switch to virtual meetings with the impacts of COVID. And we were really putting the city initiated items on uh, whichever agendas could have absorbed them best for the time um, for the board. Um, so I think Historic Preservation Board, number one, really wanted to see historic, um, I'm sorry, Planning and Zoning Board really wanted Historic Preservation Board's input before they voted. And they didn't have that. Um, okay. I also do think there was some concern um, that this was somehow, um, I don't know, making, um, uh, supporting some of the newer construction that we've seen, particularly in the historic district. Um, and, um, you know, we weren't maybe explaining the issue related to a couple of the existing buildings that were built with smaller setbacks as well as we could have. Um, so, um, and then Historic Preservation Board, they were, you know, they were, they were worried about everything from clearance, which honestly the Florida Building Code um, does help us with what is a safe clearance and a distance from the face of curb and things like that. So I, I just think, you know, what our boards are rightfully so they're very cautious, particularly when we are dealing with anything that touches OSHAD. Um, but this is really intended to help buildings like the Colony Hotel that has new awnings coming out and can't really put the signage that, you know, historically was on the balance without this adjustment or the Hagen Doss building, which is in a historic building and they can't have the same signage that the other businesses can have. Um, so, so this sort of helps them move forward. But I, I think it was, I think just a natural protective instinct towards our historic property, in my opinion. And, and it made us review everything again, to be fair, that made us look more and more critically at, you know, what we were trying to achieve. And um, we had viewed this as almost a cleanup um, during a little bit of the downtime with being moved to remote. Um, and and uh, so it's, we've been very thoroughly reviewed at this point, <laughs> extremely well. So I, I feel really confident moving forward that this will, um, will be a good change for the city. Okay, great. Um, anyone want to, uh... Have any, any any concerns, questions? If not, we'll go to a, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I just on the on the record, I just want to say that that was exactly my question as well. And I appreciate staff walking us walking us through that. And uh, I'm gonna make a motion to approve. Um, no, no. No, nope, I won't. <laughs> public comment, please. Sorry. Yeah, okay. this is a public comment. So what we're gonna do is kind of take five and so that's five. It's five thirty-four right now. We'll go to five thirty-nine. We'll see you back at five thirty-nine. Five thirty-nine.
Okay, it's 539. Can bring everybody back. Ms. Kateri, do we have any comments? No, Madam Mayor, we did not receive any comments. Very good. Okay, so now um, any more comments from the commission? If none, um, entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson? Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes, and Ms. Johnson's trying to speak, just so you know. Can you? Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, Ms. Johnson, your vote, please. Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Frankel? Yes. Secretary, sorry to interrupt like that. No problem. Uh, Ms. Cassell? Ms. Cassell? My apologies, yes. Mr. Boston. Yes. Okay, passes unanimously. Um, moving on to 8B ordinance uh, 02 21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances, Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.3, District Regulations, General Provisions, Section 4.3.3. Special requirements for specific uses to add subsection 4.3.3 double R rooftop use to provide basic regulations for rooftop uses, amending section 4.3.4 base district development standards, subsection 4.3.4 J height to update height exceptions, amending article 4.6 supplemental district regulations, section 4.6.18 architectural elevations and aesthetics, subsection 4.6.18 B building and structure requirements to provide regulations. For the screening of flat roofs and appurtenances, amending Appendix A definitions to amend the definition for architectural feature and parapet and to add a definition for freestanding features, rooftop appurtenances and rooftop terrace, providing a conflict clause and a severability clause authority to codify and providing an effective date. And this is second reading. Fantastic. Ms. You notice? Um, okay, so just to give you a Brief recap, there have not been changes between first and second reading. Um, you know, this is uh, the long awaited, I think, um, um, amendment to the LDR to clarify the types of appurtenances that we expect to be on the top of buildings, um, the access and how we regulate the access, particularly in our residential districts. Um, as you know, the existing code does have quantitative standards, but not very many outside of parapets and um, the process for achieving um, additional height beyond the building um, building height. And of course, uh, the reality is, is that our buildings have a lot going on on the roof, whether it's AC units um, or uh, elevator overruns, um, and then also the stair access that is frequently required by Florida Building Code, particularly to um, buildings that are four stories tall um, and others, or that have um, elevator roof equipment. And we had workshops, we've had a couple of um, zoning in progress extensions due to um, you know, the process slowing down a little bit with COVID. And so ultimately the idea is that yes, we think it's really great to be on your roof in a residential district, um, but not to grab sort of additional space above um, the three stories that's generally expected. Um, and so what is before you, um, provides a couple of different tiers. Um, first of all, it provides far more quantitative limitations on what is up there. It provides definitions that were clear on what types of, of um, elements we're talking about. Um, and then um, those that can be administratively approved versus those that require board action. Um, there's a distinction between the residential zoning versus the non-residential and it does provide for some reduction in the height of elements, particularly related to parapets and freestanding features in the residential neighborhoods and adds area limitations um, to some of, of what happens on the roof. And so in a nutshell, the diff, part of the difference is the defining the element, how tall can it be, how is it approved, but then also what, what emerged through the workshop, which is that some of it is the use itself, where is it okay to utilize your rooftop as 
um, an, an active area of your building. And so the residential districts, which for these purposes, the ordinance includes OSHAD and the RO districts, um, rooftop uh, uses um, can't be located higher than 26 feet. Um, which keeps them from going on top of a third story that certainly allows um, plenty of design flexibility and opportunity to utilize outdoor spaces on top of the first or second story. Um, and then for mixed use and commercial districts um, where it can be higher um, and um, how those would work and what is allowed up there heed more towards the zoning districts at that point. So this but, you know, this, and just to be clear, Central Business District has had rooftop regulations in place already. This does not change those, but we do have other districts like Emrock and other places where um, this type of use might be desirable. And so standards for those things, including that if you expand restaurant or active uses for businesses out onto the roof, that you do have to park for them. Um, certainly encouraging and requiring landscaping and setbacks and other things to ensure privacy to adjacent properties. Um, again, there are no changes between the draft that you saw first reading in this one. Um, and I believe that um, we had one comment that once we uh, engaged with um, that person, um, it, we didn't, it, it didn't require a change to the ordinance. It just required sort of tracking through and explaining it a little bit. So um, with that, that concludes my presentation um, in this case. Uh, the recommending boards um, all unanimously approved the proposed um, ordinance. And that concludes my presentation, unless you have questions. Thank okay, you. well, let's um, let's go ahead and this, this is a public uh, hearing as well. So let's go ahead and go to the public uh, part of this. It's now uh, 546, we'll come back at 551 and then we'll have discussion.
All right, everyone. <laughs> Here, kitty, kitty. <laughs> Ms. Kateri, did we get any comments? No public comments. Okay, anyone want to speak to this? If not, we'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. No Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Ms. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes, thank you. Ms. Mr. Boylston? Yes. All right, moving on to public hearing number three, which is 8C ordinance number 03-21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach by amending Chapter 4 Zoning Regulations, Article 4.4 Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.13 Central Business CBD District, by amending Subsection 4.413D Configuration of Buildings to add the Railroad Corridor Subdistrict of the Central Business District as an exception to standard building height regulations of the Central Business District. By amending tables 4.4.13b, building height, and 4.4.13c, dimensional requirements by CBD subdistrict, to increase the maximum number of stories allowed in the railroad corridor subdistrict south of Southeast 2nd Street. By amending subsection 4.4.13h of the Senate program to require the provision of workforce housing for a density increase of above 30 dwelling units per acre within the railroad corridor subdistrict south of Southeast 2nd Street, providing a complex clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify providing an effective date and for other purposes. And this is the last second reading item. Very good, thank you. Anthea. Good evening, this is a privately initiated amendment and the applicant is here um, with the presentation. Okay, very good. So we'll recognize Ms. Niskell if she's with us. I see her hand up. So I think somebody that IT needs to Bring her in. There we go. Oh. Uh, this is fine. I, I hear you. I just don't see you. You can go right ahead if you. Okay. Don't have thank you. Oh wait, I can. I'll start my video. Well, oh, let there me start. Okay. We'll, be, uh, we'll be brief. This is second reading, and we did do a full presentation, so hopefully um, we can get through this very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Bonnie Miskell, by the way, here on behalf of the applicant. So uh, to refresh your memory, uh, our request before you is to increase the permitted number of stories from amend the regulations to increase the permitted number of stories from four to five in the railroad corridor subdistrict in areas south of Southeast Second Street with a maximum permitted height to remain at 54. The next portion of the request is to amend the regulations to increase density from 30 dwelling units per acre to seven, 70 dwelling units per acre in the railroad corridor subdistrict in areas, again, south of Southeast Second Street and subject to the residential incentive program. Inclusion of properties in the railroad corridor subdistrict south of the Southeast Second Street in the residential incentive program through the provision of workforce housing which would require 20% of the total density to be equally distributed between very low, low and moderate income levels. As a footnote, at the last meeting, at first reading, um, Commissioner Boylston uh, commented that he wasn't ready to consider the second part or the third part actually of our request, which would have allowed automated parking garages um, in this railroad corridor sub-district we are requesting to postpone that request until such time as the apparently the pending uh, application and pending construction of an automated garage is constructed and the city is able to evaluate it for its efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, we agree to advertise um, as applicable. Uh, my client agrees to pay all costs associated with advertising and our request is to bring it back for first and second readings to the city commission. Next page, please. So you've seen this chart before. I'll go over it very quickly for any um, public members of the public that may not have attended the first reading. Uh, this breaks down the components that we had originally applied for 
And after extensive community outreach and also participation through the process with staff and the PNZ board and the city commission, where we ended up. Um, we had previously asked for an increase in height. Uh, we have removed that request. The current LDRs allow for 54 feet and we are not making any changes or requesting any changes to that. As I mentioned before, um, we are asking to go from four to five stories at a maximum height of 54. Uh, we had previously asked for six stories that was reduced after planning and zoning board. Maximum density under the current LDRs is 30. Uh, we had previously sought to go to 80 um, with the inclusion of the residential incentive program. We've reduced that down to 70 dwelling units per acre, a reduction of 10 units to the acre. With the residential incentive program under the current LDRs, the workforce housing units are for the bonus density and it can be at either all of the mixed levels or moderate. We are committed to 20% of the total density at all levels in an equal, equal pro rata share, uh, which is a difference from what we had previously requested. We were applying it only to the bonus density. So again, this is 20% of the total density equally distributed amongst, the, amongst all income levels. Uh, appurtenances, we removed our request. We're applying uh, whatever is applicable under the city code. Um, uh, we've removed our request related to setbacks, um, both front side and rear. We're meeting and exceeding, um, at least in our project, are exceeding it. So this amendment does not include anything associated with setbacks. Again, deleting our request at the moment for automated parking garage, requesting it to continue it to a future date to be advertised at my client's expense for first and second reading. Next page, please. So uh, this is a depiction of the CBD RC Southern Corridor. It is that area that outlined in black south of South East 2nd Street. Um, bordering the railroad tracks on each side. Next slide, please. As we've mentioned in past meetings, over a year ago, we started with the community and we're pretty much finishing up with the community. We've met with all of the property owners surrounding this, the uh, parcel in question, and most of the property owners within the Southern Corridor Railroad District. We've also spent hours with the Osceola Park community. Uh, and after much deliberation, uh, many tweaks to what we were proposing, uh, there are letters and emails and petitions that are part of the record reflecting their full support. In fact, we only have had one owner initially have some concerns about the proposal and that owner has come around with conditions that we, my client intends to fully comply with. Um, next slide, please. So we're talking hundreds of people we've talked to at this point. And here are some of the samples of those people with their locations. And by the way, they are all located within the surrounding community. Um, this is a letter from Mr. Quillian, who is the president of the HOA. He may be speaking in the public hearing um, this evening, fully supportive. Um, they have been working very hard to improve their commun community and they are very, very much behind this and hope that the commission today will pass this so that this too can make their community that much better and motivate others to help uh, bring the community up to what, they, what they've been striving for. Next, please. I mentioned, we showed you this at the last hearing and I wanted to just bring it back to you to show you, point out some things that really weren't discussed. Um, this is contained within your always uh, Delray comprehensive plan amendment. This is the residential neighborhood stabilization map. And, and what this map looks at are those areas uh, throughout the city that are stabilized those that need revitalization and those that need rehabilitation. The dark orange is rehabilitation. The area around the railroad corridor on the southern end is a, a brownish orange um, um, 
denotation, which is which signifies revitalization. There has been a lot of discussion on how the northern part, north of Atlantic, um, they've been able to do things within the current um, regulations and the current standards. But if you look at how those areas are depicted on the map, they're stable. Yet what the neighborhood has been so desperately trying to change is the fact that their area does need revitalization. In fact, if you look at those areas around Atlantic and in particular within the CBD, this is the one area that is that it that stands out more than any other as needing revitalization. So what is before you this evening is in fact to do just that, to help this area uh, revitalize, to help this area meet the vision that others have, have already met to be part of the city and to feel the same way that others that are in different communities feel. So I just wanted to point you point that out. Some of the other projects that have been built Almost all of them were on the north side, with the exception of those that we had presented to you on the last meeting, and, and those exceeded your regulations. They were built under the old code. Uh, next, next slide, please. At this point, we are finished. I think you've heard so much about this text amendment, and you've heard from so many people that we won't belabor that. I would like to reserve some time after, um, before you close the public hearing, if I may, for rebuttal if necessary. Thank you very much, Mayor and Commissioners. Very good. So at this point, we will go to, um, I'm sorry, this, the city, right? City, do you have a um, presentation? Yeah, it's, it's pretty brief, just to be clear um, on what changed between first and second reading, that's all. Um, is, can you see my screen? Sometimes when I switch them between the applicant and mine, it doesn't come through. So tell me if you can't see. Yes. Um, okay. So I just, I do want to reiterate um, that this is a code amendment. It will affect every parcel in the subdistrict, not just the applicant's property. Um, so, you know, everybody that's within the southern part. Um, initially, the amendment affected both both sides of the railroad corridor subdistrict, which is why it had gone to DDA for approval. Um, and I just want to be clear for anyone watching that this part is no longer part of the application. We're only talking about the area south of Second Street. Um, and, you know, we are basically setting the table that we are not guaranteeing the meal. <laughs> so these are the rules that everybody will build um, by in this, um, in this um, area. So, um, you know, it's just something to, to consider in terms of what has been um, demonstrated to everyone. Um, okay, so first reading, I think um, you had a really great chart by the applicant that showed how the um, ordinance has evolved. Um, what you saw at first reading was it was the increase in number of stories to number of stories to five within the same envelope, increase the density from 30 dwelling units per acre to 70, requiring that 20% of the total density on site. Um, accommodate very low, low and moderate income levels. And there was a provision to expand um, the automatic, automatic automated parking garage system um, that is allowed um, in, the, in the North District. I would just let everybody know who's watching this that um, on Northeast Third, the first one is under construction, it's coming vertical. So we will get a good, I think, um, indication of how loud they are, how well they work, you know, all of those things once that one is up and running. Um, so what is before you now in second reading, um, the, the applicant has absolutely accurately explained, um, makes that change to 20% of the total density on site and has eliminated for now the, auto, the expansion of the automated parking garage use. So that is not in the amendment before you today. Um, I also want to take a moment to clarify um, because, um, you know, we value our recommendary board very much and um, planning and voting board had a, had a split vote and it, um, I, I tried to make it clear. I think I do a better job in the slide than I did in the agenda cover memo, but here's what happened. There was a motion to recommend approval uh, provided that uh, the text amendment incorporated um, the total density that you see actually in the final version of the ordinance before you today. Um, 
the uh, the vote to approve was three to four, which means that it failed. And there was not another motion, for example, one to deny or a change in conditions that was made. So just for the record, want to be 100% clear on, on what Planning and Zoning Board voted on on January 25th. And that concludes my presentation. Okay, great. So we are with a final public hearing and we're gonna go to break. So if anybody'd like to call in, we'll be back at uh, 611.
Ms. Johnson. Yes. Okay. Okay, and everyone. We. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Ms. Johnson, I think you have your um, speaker yes, on. Yes, I do. Oh. I do. Okay. We're all coming back at six uh, six eleven. Uh, Mr. Terry, do we have any comments? Yes, we do have one. Okay. I was sworn in. My name is James Quillian, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. Uh, item number is 8C. The homeowners of Osceola Park support this item number 8C, ordinance number 03-21 regarding the CBD District Railroad Corridor. The residents of this area have voiced their, their concern and support of this multiple times. It's time for the whole Commission of Delray to be team resident and vote in favor of this project. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Okay, so let's give um, Ms. Miskell, did you want to have, you said you reserved some time? Uh, yes, or please. Do you, want, I could... want, do you want to talk after the commission or do you want to, did you want to do that now? Oh, I'll, I'll speak now so that you don't okay. have to again. Um, you know, it's, it's ironic. Um, Mr. Quillian talked about team resident. Uh, no one knows better than me that, that it is not often that team resident and team developer necessarily see eye to eye on any particular matter, but they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. And in this instance, this is an example of the community coming together and the developer sitting with them as many times and as uh, often as they wanted to speak to us, we sat there and we took note of their concerns and what they wanted. And what we're presenting to you this evening is how they feel and they feel very strongly about it. So uh, at that, I will uh, I will leave it to your, in your capable hands that you'll do the right thing. And we appreciate the time that you've given us to present this to you this evening. Thank you, Ms. Miskell. Okay, moving on to Commissioner Cassell. Anthea, may I ask you a question? Because look, I, I appreciate, and this is to Ms. Miskell, um, the modifications that you've made, I very much appreciate. And I, I will say that. And I am not, I'm concerned about the 233% increase and the 301, sorry, I shouldn't call it 301 apartments, the project 301. But, um, but what is, the area is 1.4 acres that this particular project that we were shown would be on. What is the whole affected area? If you go back to that slide that shows the um, yellow, how much area are we talking about? If we could, um, Madam Mayor, if I may respond. Sure, absolutely. If you look at the, uh, the, lower, the lower graphic, right. um, it is only that portion of the CBD that's designated RC and it goes from Southeast second um, and it narrows down very, very um, narrowly to, I believe it's fourth. I can't really see it on yours. My actually our slide is a little bit better. It's only that. And I couldn't tell you what the total acreage is. The, it's not, we're not here to discuss my client's project. My client's project is approximately that size. But I think the right. total area, right. We did do in the last presentation, I think we did talk about the sites that were already revitalized. And there were only a very small number of properties that are in a position to apply this right now. But in theory, it's the entire RC corridor that is shown here that wraps around the, the tracks. Right. If, I, if I could I just, just make one, just just yeah. on this graphic, just to be clear, uh, it actually includes this little lot here as well, which the um, alleys to the north. Um, I, I think this is part of maybe Tyler Knight's property here, but this was added. And I think that the graphic and the code wasn't updated with the regulating plan. So it's these, including this sliver. But Anthea, did somebody, do we know the size of that? I look, it abuts um, single family property. And if, if Ms. Miskell were just doing this for her one development, I would think it would be something we should consider 
because I do agree that we need some revitalization in that area. And I don't think it would be the end of the world, and especially in light of the modification she made. But some of the things that concerns me are some of the policies that your staff put in the planning and zoning um, agenda. You know, uh, objective 2.2, which is to protect and enhance the village by the sea character in the downtown neighborhoods. Um, you know, uh, NDC 1.1.14, which is um, complementary and compatible uh, uses. And this is a budding single family neighborhood. So I guess I'm just trying to get an idea of what size is this area? What What is it going to look like in the future? What are we potentially doing? Because that's the concern. If this were just this 1.4 acres, I would be amenable to this. And I, I wouldn't be hesitating, but under these circumstances, I'm concerned about the compatibility of the adjoining buildings. It says uh, policy NDC 2.7.16, continue to support the variety of commercial and light industrial uh, uses on land with mixed use and land designations in Osceola Park. I mean, there's things in this that recommend this. Uh, this very thing we're considering tonight. So how much land is affected? So when you're amending the LDRs, you're amending the rules for everyone. Um, in this right. case, it's, so here's, yeah, this lot, this, that lot is in. So, so just to be clear, it's not the same on both sides. So um, right. the purple is the central business district, which currently has four stories. Um, allowed right. within 54 feet. And as we went over in the first um, presentation, you know, the goal for that was taller ceilings and adaptive reuse. Um, and we did, you know, raise the issue of, of, you know, squeezing in extra floors and the ramifications of that really shifting it towards the residential only use over time. Um, so what's across the street to the West, however, is even though it's, there is a lot of single family there, it is RM which ultimately has um, a, density, uh, a building height of 35 feet. So it would be a transition between 35 and 54. To be clear, these changes definitely make it um, more amenable to be able to maximize potential height over time because now you have more units to put in them. Um, uh -huh. So the, um, the density um, across the street, even though it's RM, it is within an infill um, in revitalization zone for workforce housing. So conceivably across the street, you could have 35 feet and 24 units per acre. This change will allow five stories of 54 feet and 70 units per acre. And so, you know, that's a pretty dramatic transition potentially. Um, the other right. side goes directly into single family and that's why Osceola Park, you know, weighing in so, um, you know, heavily has, um, I think it's important because they, you know, will be the one impacted potentially because you have to look at it as in the long run that, you know, these parcels could be right next to single family with five-story buildings, um, particularly if eventually the parking is, um, you know, you can build what you can park at the end of the day. So once you have a system that allows you to squeeze in more cars, it just makes it that much easier to build. These are all exciting, interesting things, but they're important to consider just in terms of making sure there aren't surprises across the street from somebody's home. Um, again, the the, um, the central business district, the code does have a lot of design standards in it, um, more so than any other district. And so that does help with um, making sure that your best base is forward, but right now it is 70 units per acre backing up to single family and um, across the street from anywhere between 12 to 24. Right, thank you for that information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Wilson. Yes, uh, Anthea, can, can you discuss in our comp plan where it's where it, it, it speaks about the increase of uh, a, a density in a program like this? Increase in density. Okay, so um, 
we basically within, I have a lot of slides that I just had hidden because I didn't know how much you wanted to hear again. Um, well, I think this is so important. The way that our comp, okay. So the way that our comp plan is structured, I'm looking for it. Um, we have, and I don't have it. Okay. So we have um, what we call the standard density for a lot of um, districts. Um, and you, you'll see this here. Um, the standard density, for example, for um, an MD land use is five to 12. Um, and then we have a revitalization or incentive land use or um, density, excuse me. And that's the maximum amount that through um, purposefully adopted programs that do things like realize redevelopment plans or nice. um, forward other community benefits that the, that the commission identifies in the LDR. Um, the only one that we really have uh, that's really active is um, increases for the purpose of workforce housing. So right. the MD here is in one of those districts. So it's got um, an allowance to go beyond the standard density of five to 12, up to 12 to 24 for that purpose. Um, so the change that you see happening here um, in this proposal utilizes that same tool. Our comp plan has a base density for the central business district in this area, it's 30 units per acre. Um, and then it can go all the way up to potentially 100, which the only development we have is the city that ever has gone that tall is, or that close to that is Worthing Place. So um, we Just to say that, that again, in the comp, yeah, yeah. In the comp plan, it, it, yeah. it states up to 100 for that density you, increase. That you can do that. And that's why right. this, can be brought forward because the, right. the upper the land use allows it for this. If you deem that this is a purposeful, um, right. you know, place to incentivize this. Great, I, I, I thank you for for, mm -hmm. for pointing that out. Um, you know, I, I it's good timing. Um, because I think this project has been molded by the community. I think it's been molded by our boards. It's been molded by our, our, our commission and has changed drastically. This is exactly how the process is, is supposed to work. Um, there, I, I, I appreciate Ms. Miskell quoting our mayor in regards to uh, team resident, team developer. Listen, we're all on the same team. All right, we're all working together trying to do what's best for our city. This is a blighted area. Um, we are looking at a project with a height of 54, 54 feet and the type of density that we are all in favor of on West Atlantic with the BH3 project. Um, and that one, we actually had to pay for that development or we had to subsidize by giving the land. Here, we don't have to, and it's on the railroad district. Um, it's important to point out that a required element of our comp plan according to the Florida statute 1633177. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I was in a meeting this week as a, as your, your uh, representative for our affordable, our affordable uh, housing coalition. And they said it requires local governments to plan for the provision of all housing for all current and anticipated future residents, not just affordable housing, um, all housing that we should be planning for, putting in our comp plan, putting in programs, and then in addition to programs specific to affordable housing, local government comprehensive plans specific to affordable housing. But first it says we must plan for all housing. And it also stated, stated the importance and stress the importance of multifamily and density bonus programs, which I was very proud to be able to, you know, give Delray Beach as an example that we've approved th three projects um, that have that density program. I mean, it really got like Oz from all the cities that were on this workshop, uh, which I thought was pretty, which, which I thought was pretty exciting. If you if you go this many blocks north on that same road, you're going to see pineapple growth. The neighborhoods that are right next door, that whether it's Del Del Ida or it's um, Bankers Row. Those individuals were on the boards. They advocated for Pineapple Grove. They wanted a place like that. They wanted a blighted area to be a thriving extension of the downtown and to include, include additional housing. And those projects didn't get the 20% workforce housing of very low, low and, and moderate. 
that we're working into these projects. They just wanted housing period and they wanted a blighted area cleaned up. And I think that was a huge success and it took visionaries that I was proud to sit on the board uh, with of Pineapple Grove over, you know, over 10 years ago. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we're looking at this. We're looking at this chart right here, uh, how we molded this project. We're looking at our comprehensive plan and how it's our number one responsibility to plan for anticipated, for current and anticipated future residents of our city. Um, and that we're not going to vilify development that is bringing housing and eliminating blight and is backed by an entire community. Um, so I think this is really this is really important for Delray Beach to, to understand. And uh, I'm very much in favor of this project. I appreciate the applicant working so hard to mold this project and everyone that has provided input. And, uh, and it couldn't align more with our comprehensive plan and what we our leaders have, what vision our leaders have had in the past, which is just mirrored on the other side of, uh, of second. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Frankel. Thank you, and uh, Mr. Boylston, you, you really said it well. Um, you know, Ms. Miskell, I don't know if you're still on, I assume you still are, but thank you very much for the presentation. The latest, I mean, this kind of reminds me of when we um, had the SOFA project. And um, I remember everyone thinking it was terrible, it was too much, no one's gonna move there. And uh, they built it and the people come and, you know, they're, they're, they're young professionals who, uh, I think it's a full, full complex and I've heard nothing but good things. And the fact that you have something that really will uh, make a difference in Osceola Park and you have Osceola Park who for years have been begging for assistance. Now recall the one uh, caller um, at our last meeting stating, she compared the SOFA uh, buildings and the assistance it did for their community and thinks that it will do the same. So uh, I, I appreciate it. I'm team James Quillian, I'm team Osceola Park and I support the uh, item tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Deputy Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I don't know if Commissioner Cassell was ahead of me, but uh, I'll take this oh. chance. I, I just, that's all right. I, I'm gonna okay. preempt you, Commissioner Cassell. That's all right, I won't be long. I just wanted to commend everyone for all your hard work in making this happen because the community is so in support of it. I drive through there now very cautiously because every street appears to be under reconstruction they're doing their alleys, they're laying their pipes, they're going, it's just something you want to avoid because none of the streets are smooth, but no one seems to be complaining. So this is another opportunity to utilize a space that probably would never be utilized. It's gonna beautify our city. And I had a thought that probably no one else may have thought about. If you have a home that's next to the railroad track, if someone puts up a high rise, you're now buffered. You're not going to hear the sounds, the noise, and perhaps some of the energy will be absorbed by these buildings. So I look forward to another uh, dank, dark hole in our city being filled. And thank you, uh, Ms. Miskell, for keeping your present presentation so short. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Cassell? Um, to clarify, I'm not vilifying anyone. I'm asking questions because when I'm reading the staff report um, provided by Ms. Alvarez, and to clarify, that's Amy Alvarez, it draws attention to these concerns. And, you know, there's also the concern that um, this went in front of the PNZ board twice and was denied both times. And I do appreciate the modifications, but that's something to consider is there's a recommendation from our advisory board against this project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. Anthea, did you want to step in? I just wanted to add one one more thing with the discussion. I don't think had been said at first reading or, or, or now. I'm sorry, I couldn't find my little electronic hand, so I was waving at you. Okay. Um, 
when and the way that the central business district code works is that when a project is coming forward that is utilizing the increase in density for workforce housing um, ultimately the site plan and the design will um, go through SPRAB um, and ultimately to the commission for approval so there is greater control in those developments in terms of the approval process because it will come before this board for final action um, we haven't had a lot of these yet because right now the only district that has uh, that incentive is West Atlantic and we haven't seen unfortunately a lot of development come through yet. Um, you will be seeing one shortly with Atlantic Grove. But in terms of the ultimate quality of the development that comes forward, this board will have um, final evaluation of the site plans if that, if that helps at all with Thank the compatibility you. concerns. Uh, Commissioner, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Boylston, do you have your hand up to speak again? Yeah, yeah just real quick. I just wanted to say to Com Commissioner Casal, um, I, I did not mean those comments towards, towards you. Um, I've been painted as team developer by our mayor. I'm just anticipating the email that will be sent tomorrow um, stating the same thing. So I did not mean that towards you at all. And I appreciate your questions. Ms. Siskel, you have your hand up. Is that in it, it inadvertently or are you asking to speak? You're, you don't, okay, very good. Yeah, okay, so. Um, Lots of things happen in in in, uh, in elections, so you know, get over it. Um, we have nothing else to say. Then let's just go to a um, an, a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. I'm sorry, no. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good, day. good, good evening. Moving on to first reading, we have 9A Ordinance 04 21. In the ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, rezoning the HHH Bush. Bush Building Special Activities District SAD to the 1177 Modern Special Activities District SAD for the property as more particularly described herein. Repealing ordinance numbers 38 84, 39 90, and 01 11 in their entirety. Amending the land development regulations of the Code of Ordinances, Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.25, Special Activities District SAD, Subsection 4.4.25H, SADS to add 1177 Modern, said land generally located north of George Bush Boulevard between the Intracoastal Waterway and Andrews Avenue, as more particularly described herein, many of the city of Delray Beach zoning map in June 29, 2017, providing a conflicts clause and a severability clause, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Casal, you have Okay, this is a privately initiated rezoning request and then the applicant is here, please. Um, Mr. Bernardo is going to present and I'll forward your slides for you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the commission for this evening's time. Uh, we'll make this as, as uh, thorough as possible and brief at the same time. We are seeking uh, approval of the proposed ordinance 04-21, which is seeking the modification of the development standards for the special activities district. Uh, this district is what is currently known as the HHH building uh, special activities district. It's a single parcel uh, district. Uh, next, next slide, please. So a little bit about uh, the site first. So we have a point of reference. Uh, the, the site is located at 1177 George Bush Boulevard. Uh, this is just east of the Intercoastal Waterway along George Bush Boulevard. The site is approximately 1.39 acres and is zoned the Special Activities District. Again, the zone is limited to this parcel. It is a transitional uh, mixed use designation. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this district has since 1963 had at its location what was known as the HHH building. Uh, I think it's important to understand this, uh, this district by its history. Uh, the HHH building was the only five-story structure uh, located on George Bush Boulevard at a height of uh, 48 feet. It's an over 20, it was over an over 27,000 square foot uh, building that had uh, general and professional office, office use. The special activities district itself was established for this property in 1984. And in 1984, the establishment allowed the commercial, the conditional commercial use of the property, which was its general and professional offices, as well as all permitted uses in the RM10 district. And at the time, uh, that is a multifamily residential medium density of 10, 10 units per acre back in 1984. And from a period of time from 1984 to 2011, uh, the property had uh, was limited to only commercial use along the uh, primarily residential corridor there. And in 2011, the, the SAD was modified, and again, uh, we're talking about a special activities district, which we're, we're, we're using the words rezoning here, but in, in essence, the, the commission uh, by ordinance sets the development standards for that special activities district. And, and that is that is what SAD uh, determines. The zone is a special activities district. So in 2011, as we are here uh, asking for modification, there was a further modification to that uh, SAD that uh, preserved the commercial use as a permanent use and modified to allow a single residence of less than four, uh, less than uh, 5,000 square feet, which would be located on the, uh, on the fifth floor of the, I'm sorry, uh, yes, on the fifth floor of the building and of no more than four uh, bedrooms. And that's the current uh, development standards that exist at the site. And from a time period of 1984 to 2011, again, this property did allow an RM10 with limited commercial, and uh, the 2011 established its its residential uh, limited use. Next, next slide, please. So, so what is unique about this property? Why is this property um, a special activities district? Well, by looking history, if you'll see in 1984 again. This property had as its permitted use any, any of the RM10 residential uses. But what is unique about it is, is quite clear from an aerial view. Uh, this property is a, uh, is a triangular shape, three boundary lines to the north, south, and west. It has an over 577 square footage of frontage along the northeast, southwest curvature of George Bush Boulevard. And at its western boundary, it's 200 feet of depth. And of course, to a point on its eastern at uh, zero, zero depth. Next slide, please. So what's in, the, uh, what's in the vicinity? Again, nothing resembling the shape of this property, uh, but the SAD, as it's denoted as the purple uh, SAD on the, on the uh, snapshot, borders medium density residential multifamily districts in, in all directions. Again, this is on the barrier uh, corridor uh, of George Bush Boulevard, Barrier Reef, Reef Corridor. The current SAD uh, development standards provide a limited permissible, permissible commercial use. And currently, it is an underutilized and out of character uh, site with its surrounding uh, community. Uh, and currently, the, the site is vacant. The, the, the building and the, the five story building was taken down. Prior to that takedown, the building was underoccupied for a number of years. Uh, and although the SAD allowed for a number of different businesses located, the building had a single pharmacy tenant uh, for some time prior to the current owner's acquisition of the property. Next slide, please. So what's around uh, our SAD district? Well, another aerial gives you an idea of the, of the multifamily that uh, and golfs are our SAD district. You have the Seastone Apartments, the Valhalla Condominium, 800 Ocean Place, Waterway North Condo, Inlet Cove, landings of uh, Delray Beach Condominium, all within the immediate vicinity of our SAD district. Next slide, please. 
So again, the current development standards that um, that dictate the use of this property allow a very limited and inappropriate commercial use to land. The current standards are non-conforming to the surrounding residential multifamily community. It's underutilized and inappropriate land use and other elements important in, in our comprehensive plan analysis, which we'll, which we'll cover in a minute, is that it has very minimal green space, a higher traffic flow in a residential community, and it's non-conforming to the city's comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. What we are proposing as modifications to the SAD is to allow for the development of what will be a unique three-story residential condominium, private club, thermal suite, dog park, and other amenities. The proposed modification of the development standards in, in the proposed ordinance will allow this site to conform to the surrounding community. And again, no change is necessary or appropriate to the actual SAD. We are looking for changes to the development standards dictating the SAD. Uh, next slide, please. What we are proposing uh, is uh, these are these are renderings, uh, plan renderings for what will be 1177 Modern at the at the uh, location. This is a rendering bearing northwest from George Bush Boulevard, which we will be proposing a three-story residential condominium building as opposed to what was a five-story commercial building at the location of 16 residential units, each approximately 2,200 square feet under air. Uh, the lot coverage will be less than 40% and we'll have a significant increase of green space to over 25% uh, at the site. And again, we're gonna have the proposed use will reduce the height from the current allowable 48 feet to what is uh, proposed in the ordinance under the LDR of a maximum of 39 feet. Next slide, please. This is a uh, another rendering bearing south of 1177 Modern. Again, it's going to contain a unique private club with a private uh, a spa thermal suite housed in a detached single story structure seen to your, uh, seen to your immediate uh, right. The pool and fitness center and dog park and pavilions will all be available for residents use. And again, on the, on the premises. Next slide, please. We are proposing to have a density of 12 units per acre, which is not an increase in density from its current allowable use in conformity with the neighboring residential district. The setbacks of 15 feet along the perimeter and 50 feet from the center line of George Bush Boulevard. There will be 45 parking spaces at the structure floor. Again, a reduction of the current allowable parking spaces at the site. And uh, the site will be elegantly landscaped throughout with, with uh, foxtailed palms, dwarf protocarpus, Japanese blueberry trees, and other visually aesthetic um, greenery. Increase of green space will be to over 25% at the site. Next slide, please. This is a view of what would be the master development plan for 1177 Modern. And as you can see, the parking Parking spaces will be located under the three-story structure um, as opposed to the current, um, current hardscape at the property. There'll be the increase in green space, and as you can see, the pool to the, uh, to the rear of the, of, the west, uh, of the west side of the property. Next slide, please. So what we are proposing to summarize, we are proposing, proposing the permitted uses to be a three-story, 16-unit residential condominium and private club with spa, thermal suite, pool, fitness center, dog park, and pavilions available to the residents of the development and their guests. We are seeking maximum density of 12 units per acre. Again, not an increase of any density allowable at the site. Setbacks of 15 feet along George's Boulevard and perimeter and 50 feet from the center line of George Bush. Maximum building height of 39 feet as opposed to the current 48 feet. So we'll be reducing the allowable height. Lot coverage maximum of 40%, which includes any buildings, pavement, hardscape, site improvements of the property. Minimum open space, non-vehicular land area equal to at least 25% of the total district, including the perimeter landscape boundary shall be in open space. Landscape areas required to meet internal parking lot design requirements. And the structure size, the minimum structure size, any free standing structure shall have a minimum floor area of 400 square feet should be architecturally consistent with other structures in the development plan. And as, except, except as set forth of those 
requirements of the development standards would apply as the current LDR 4425E and 434 as opposed as applicable to the multifamily RM residential zoning district. Uh, next slide, please. So what do you have to determine when making, uh, the, what does the commission have to determine when making these, uh, when considering the request? We look at two applicable LDR provisions. Number one would be LDR 4425A, which dictates the uses and activities and characteristics of a special activities district. And I read the properties, uses and activities and characteristics will be consistent with the comprehensive plan, suitable and compatible with surrounding existing development and with the proposed character of the area. And although we're not actually changing the zoning, the zoning is staying sad, these sad uh, provisions dictate that the zoning provisions, rezoning provisions of the LDR control under your consideration. And to that, we look to LDR 245D2, which requires a similar density based on the future land, land use map and a more appropriate for the site based upon the site or neighborhood. Let's take a minute and look at a few of those main concepts to the recurrent request. Next slide, please. Consistent with comprehensive plan. The proposal, and I point to a few of the data analysis and as uh, Commissioner Bolson pointed out on the last, last uh, item on the agenda, there is a need for all housing. And uh, some of the facts taken from the housing element data analysis and statistics of our comprehensive plan make clear Delray Beach population is growing. Uh, and between 2015 and 2035, we're looking at an almost 19% growth rate. A close to 50% of the housing stock in Delray exceeds 38 years of age. And the plan calls for uh, approximately 5,400 and change additional housing units in Delray Beach up to 2035. Some of those options to expand the housing include the redevelopment of underutilized parcels where the potential for to obtain higher densities exists. And the utilization of higher densities will continue, continue to result in provision of multifamily and mixed use development versus development of single detached family housings. Those are pulled from what I, what I feel are very relevant to the request today. Uh, next slide, please. Again, we look at policy uh, 311, housing policy 311 to designate sufficient land area on the land use map with appropriate development densities to accommodate population growth and housing requirements to ensure the continued provision of diverse residential types. We also look to policy 429, which says continue to require new development to include open space, recreational amenities that pr promotes, encourages healthy living. Next slide, please. We also look to policy 1313, oh, I'm sorry, back one. Uh, we also are looking to allow a wide range of residential low density, non-residential uses for properties with a transitional land use designation to address varied community needs, unique development standards, and or distinctive uses. Again, policy 1314, use the transitional use, land use designation for properties located between two or more land use designations that allow different building scale heights, uses or levels of intensity to create a development patterns that balance the challenges and in intensity relative to the specific unique surrounding conditions. All factors we see here with the current SAD district. Next slide, please. Again, suitable and compatible with surrounding existing development and with the proposed character of the area. Uh, we had showed the slide earlier of the surrounding area which we would be proposing the current SAD district to be in conformity with the many multifamily condo, condominium units that surround the 1177 site. Next slide, please. Similar intensity based on the future land use map and a more appropriate for the site based upon the neighborhood. Well, the, the SAD is compatible with the transitional land use. Policy 1313, Again, the unique development standards and our distinctive uses. And a maximum intensity floor area ratio of one. Maximum standard density of 12 units per acre. All elements that meet our, our proposed modifications. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we have as more appropriate for the site? 
unique development standards and distinctive uses. We bring to the unique shape and configuration of the site. It is compatible with the SAD zoning designation and the transitional land, land use. And I take you to our proposed 1177 modern proposal, which is a proposed new development standards will allow the unique development pattern and distinctive uses of the 1177 project with a private club, spa, thermal suite, pool, fitness center, dog park, and pavilions. And remember, we are we are placing more housing units, but we are not increasing density uh, on the barrier island. Next slide, please. So what are the additional findings that uh, this commission must uh, consider? Concurrency, traffic performance, we will be reducing the parking at the location by 50% from the for, to a total of 45 spaces from the current 90 spaces. The modified, uh, the modification of the SAD will therefore reduce neighborhood traffic impact and decrease from the current permitted use. Solid waste, the proposed modification will decrease the site's net sewage flow. School capacity, uh, the proposed modification will allow a minimal impact on the public school system of a few students, which will be mitigated by an impact fee, which will be prepared by the developer. Drainage, the proposed drainage plan for the site does meet the 10 year and 24 hour criteria for storm water. Next slide, please. So again, to summarize, new development standards for the 1177 Modern Special Activities District. They're more suitable and compatible with the surrounding existing development and character of the area. It's more appropriate for the site. It is a redevelopment of underutilized and inappropriate use at the current site. And it does address the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan as I'd outlined. And finally, it does increase the green space at the 1177 uh, location. Next slide, please. Again, uh, we do request this uh, commission's approval of the proposed ordinance uh, for 1177 Modern, allowing for the more appropriate best use for 1177 George Bush Boulevard. Uh, I'd be open to any questions or rebuttal. Save some time for rebuttal, please. Thank you so Thank much you. to the, the state, I mean, to the staff, excuse me. Okay, um, you know, SADs are a little tricky because um, even though the map says SAD right now, when we in essence adopt a new ordinance, it is a rezoning function. I mean, we are completely changing the zoning, even though it used to be an SAD before, it's now adopting all new standards related to use and setbacks and other things. Um, and we've just recently been doing this, for example, with Parks of Delray and some of the other SADs. The other thing that happens with the SADs and is that they are tied to a specific development proposal. And so, um, you know, we'll go over the process with that as well. Um, I think the applicant provided a really great history for you over the building that was there and the uses that were on the site. Um, so again, a special activity district purpose is to provide a zone which is appropriate for projects that are not otherwise classified or for some other good reason, cannot be properly accommodated in the other zoning districts that we have in the city. And it's also the zone that we use, the zoning district we use for these large scale mixed use projects. Um, according to the LDRs, um, if you're doing a full service marina, you gotta be an SAD. Um, anyway, and then developments of regional impact or any other use that is not otherwise accommodated by the zone district. Um, so it's not really specific to having a uniquely shaped piece of property, but it's about what's unique about the use. And so what's before you now is to rezone from SAD to a new SAD um, to redevelop the property as a 16 unit residential condominium with private amenities. Um, the site plan that is attached as the master development plan will have um, as part of this SAD process, it has a companion class five going through the process that will go to SPRAB um, between first and second reading so that you will have the entire development package, you know, ready to go at second reading. So it's really important to understand that the master development plan is an exhibit to the ordinance 
and changes to that, you know, will require a planning board or other things. And so having the class five go through the, at, at the same time and ensures that this uh, final version of the master development plan is, is well vetted before second reading. Um, so when you're rezoning, because it's a whole new analysis of this, again, you are required to make findings related to land use and as stated by the applicant, the transitional land use SAD is compatible. Um, but I also want to draw your attention to the fact that RM is also compatible. Um, concurrency standards, water, sewer, traffic, drainage um, um, have been met and are fully analyzed in the staff report. Um, the school capacity um, advisory determination did um, note that uh, there would be estimated three, potentially three additional students, three additional th theoretical students out of this development. Um, Tulmosa is um, over capacity at this point, and so there is a fee that the applicant is well aware of and has agreed um, to provide. Um, the traffic is really interesting because ultimately trips per day with this redevelopment, um, 187 trips decrease. They decrease in the AM hours, they decrease in the PM hours, so there is less traffic that results from this, like, this shift to a residential project. Um, and then in terms of concurrency, that we do have a park fee per unit that um, will be required prior to the issuance of a building permit to help forward, um, forward those needs. Um, again, uh, you, the other uh, findings that the commission has to make is consistent with, consistency with the comprehensive plan. There's a full policy analysis in the staff report. The surrounding area is designated as stable in the residential neighborhood stabilization map, which we know provides some guidance um, regarding rezoning. Um, and specifically that um, when um, we're dealing with neighborhoods that are categorized as stable, um, the code says that the most restrictive residential zoning district that is applicable given um, the existing development patterns and typical lot sizes shall be applied in those areas. And so ultimately, I think the evaluation that staff has, has really strived to provide is whether um, the SAD provides the most restrictive residential zoning district compared to other choices. Uh, the surrounding developments, um, Inlet Cove, the landings of Delray, actually I think it's Delray and not Delray Beach, sorry, landing, um, and Waterway North. Our RM developments that surround um, this SAD, there is a small park pocket of RO, and it currently, while it only has a two-story small building on it, it does have the potential to grow to 35 feet. So, you know, we're looking at what potentially could come up as well. Um, so here's what the neighbors look like west of the subject property. This is a view of um, Inlet Cove. Uh, this is a view of Waterway North. This is the property, it has been cleared. Here's the small building that is currently an RO, which allows office uses. And then across the street, which is on the other side of George Bush Boulevard. And so ultimately what the staff report provides to you is that um, the difference between rezoning to a, a new SAD um, compared to the more restrictive RM zoning district results in a couple of small changes. They're not significant, but I, I do wanna point them out. Um, which is the front and the side setbacks are the same, whether you, the development standards the applicant is proposing um, or the RM district would use. Um, the third story under RM has additional like five feet of setbacks that are required and it has a greater rear setback. The height is only 35 feet. And in this case, the um, proposed height is 39 feet. The other general standards are the same. And so um, again, there's a, a full, analysis of um, the standards for rezoning as they relate to consistency in the staff report. And ultimately the consideration before you is whether the proposal meets the true intent of an SAD zoning district, whether RM would be more appropriate. If the proposed height at 39 feet with no additional upper story setbacks will adversely impact the adjacent properties and whether sufficient mitigation is provided in the development standards and ultimately the site plan, which you will see at the same time when it comes back um, to minimize any potential impact on the adjacent properties, such as reduced height, increased setback from landscaping, et cetera. Um, all of these considerations were presented to the planning and zoning board and they unanimously recommended approval of the rezoning. So the next steps from here are um, the this class five site plan will go 
to the SPRAB on March 24th and have a full review. And then that gives the opportunity to, to adjust the master development plan that is attached to the ordinance based on that review. And then ultimately once the um, commission um, after the org organizational meeting sets the dates uh, for the calendar, um, this will come back for second reading in April. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or concerns? We still here? Yeah, okay. Um, all right, uh, Commissioner Boylston? I'm yes, thank you. What, was there any discussion at the planning and zoning meeting about um, about the medium density zoning and and, uh, and and going that direction or requiring that from the applicant? Can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so um, the, the Planning and Zoning Board um, unanimously recommended approval of the SAD zoning with the development standards that were attached. Um, you know, there was, I think, some, um, you know, based on the discussion, we weren't, sh we thought that they were considering those additional upper story setbacks that RM requires um, mm -hmm. to be important, but ultimately they unanimously supported the applicant's proposal. Okay, I think that's a pretty that setback's a pretty important element, I think, of a project that's gonna be right on right on George George Bush. What what is the setback um from George Bush? Is it fifty feet? Is that what we're looking at? This is a third story setback, right, Anthea? Right. So the okay. first and second stories align in the same manner, um, whether it's RM or under the proposed new SAD development standards. Um, the George Bush Boulevard has what's called a special rate setback, um, which is taken from the center line of the road. And while, um, you know, in some cases, the, you know, the, it's a wedge shape, the applicant um, may be able to speak to this better about the, the, the feet and inches um, of, of the way that the proposal aligns. Um, it's RM requires that the third story uh, go in, which, which, which equates to an additional five feet, both on the front and the sides. And it has a greater rear setback, which would affect uh, the properties, you know, ultimately that are to the, um, the north. Um, I do want to point out um, that because it's an SAD, it comes with the design and not just the rules. And so you can see that all of the outdoor amenities have been located you know, on the north side, which just provides some separation along this part of the property line um, from, from the neighbors. But here, as it's a wedge-shaped piece, you know, starts to get a little tight. And then the, this is um, the dog park is over here. The access point is here. Um, but uh, I don't know if the applicant wants to speak to any more detail about this proposal, but... Mr. Bernardo, did you want to Bernardo, say anything? Yeah. I think that we can't hear you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Now, now we can. Okay. So thank you, Commissioner Boston. Just to address your your concerns that were well considered prior to our application. Uh, there's a few points. Uh, first of all, I do point to the shape of this of this lot as a few matters. Not only that it's a unique shape, but also the application of those development standards of the of the RM would be inappropriately applied here. And as as Anthea had, had pointed out, the 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 back, the rear setback from the, or actually the, the center line setback from George Bush Boulevard, and the allowance of us to set these standards, as that's shown on the master development plan, allows what is in effect a much more uh, thorough and visually compatible set uh, development, which is now positioned to the. Uh, western extreme of the property. So what we're actually doing in effect is we are increasing the green space and the visual space along George Bush Boulevard. But more importantly, uh, if you look at the, it is the rear setback of the RM uh, that is actually 25 feet. So applying that 25 feet to the odd shape of this property would render and, and in, in coupling with the 35 foot uh, height 
would render this property rather unusable in the fashion that would be more effective and it was proposed through this, through this proposal, given not necessarily because of the points of the RM, but because of the unique shape of this property. And, and we believe that when we had to determine how this actually came about, and that's why I did make a point of the history of the site, 1984 for almost uh, over 30 years, the current SAD all the way up till 2011 allowed, and I quote from the 1984 uh, ordinance, all which also included all permitted uses in the RM10 district. So for that time period, uh, this allowance was there for anybody to have developed this property as if it was RM. So we asked why that is, and, and we propose that the SAD is there for the reasons because of the shape and the layout of this property, which allows the more appropriate use today. So in effect, if we were to come and, and go to an RM, we would be asking for so many waivers and variances that we'd, we'd defeat the very point of the RM. Hence, the use of the SAD that was developed for this lot. I hope that answers uh, your concerns, but as for the front setback, uh, the effective uh, proposal is actually giving us more greenery uh, along George Bush Boulevard, and, a, and a, a, the structure is actually well set back from its uh, from from what was the HHH H building. Oh. I think uh, Commissioner Boylston. Well, I'll say it again. Uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, the explanation and. Uh, in, in discussing the uh, the unique property and why it has sat the way it has for so long, and uh, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. That that did answer my question. Thank you. Are you finished? Doug? I did want to add as well, just to to provide one more piece of background, is that um, when the development standards, not the building that you see, but the development standards went before the planning and zoning board, the height was proposed at 48 feet to retain the SAD ultimate height. And as part of the review of the process, the planning and zoning board and the applicant, um, the planning and zoning board recommended that the height drop down to 39 feet to ensure that the redevelopment would be closer to the 35 of the surrounding areas. And the applicant did agree to that change and it is reflected in the ordinance before you. Very good, thank you. Um, did you, were you completed, uh, Vice Mayor? Okay, Deputy Vice Mayor? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'd like, Anthea, if you would please go back to one of your slides that discuss SCAD, I believe. It pertained to the school. I didn't quite understand that one. Are you talking, oh, Anthea? I think Anthea, I think, is... Muted. Oh, you're muted. Okay, sorry, thank you. Um, one of my, my headphones are starting to run out of juice too, so <laughs> working off one. Okay, so um, when um, a new residential development comes in and is proposed, the um, part of the review is a school capacity um, availability determination. And ultimately it's to say, okay, we this many residential units are coming in, the school board is planning for the future, what their needs are gonna be. And they um, provide an analysis as to whether or not those potential new students can be accommodated in the system. In this case, then any new students that would live in this new development would go to um, Plamosa, which is over capacity. I think the other two schools were much closer to being at capacity or have availability. And so the applicant is being asked to contribute towards those future public school needs in the amount of $11,646, which is a fee that would be required at the time of building permit. So it's just part of that overall evaluation of this new development is coming into town and what are the impacts going to be. Okay, that explains it to me, but uh, it was quite interesting that I think you had a number of three students at a capacity of a price of, I'm going to round it, I think it was 11,000 something, I'll just say 12,000 mm -hmm. is the impact, so mm -hmm. that's quite a small amount of money. Just That fee is determined by the school district, not by the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we actually, they, the applicant 
fills the form out for them and, and we sign it and send it and then we get the information back and it's a partnership between the school, the city and the applicant in terms of meeting the assessed needs. Quite interesting. Just I'm sorry, I thought I was sharing. No, no, that's, I see it. It's quite interesting. It might explain why our schools are always in the state they're in. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I just had I had a question that kind of just piggybacks off of um, what uh, Vice Mayor Boylston was talking about. If and, and I think you might have answered it. I, I was trying to understand to stay with the SAD, which obviously um, well changes it. Really, it's a different SAD, but it's an SAD nonetheless. Um, to have gone with a different uh, type of zoning you're saying that it would have negated uh, with all the variances and the and the and the um, waivers needed it would have kind of negated that that uh, that type of zoning is that is that correct mr. Bernardo is that what I'm understanding that that's correct and I'll, I'll point out too is that and I think this is also relevant yes thank you that would be the proper uh, slide to show so I, I'll point out as well that the 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 HHH building that was located on this site, even that building had violated the uh, what was the 10 foot setback in the rear. And if you see the 10 foot setback in the rear or the or the rear, just as as this property comes to a point again to a zero uh, point uh, on the far east to apply a 25 foot uh, setback to the rear, coupled with the uh, floor restrictions is going to really underutilize the property. And, and what we'd be doing is asking for so many variances and, and waivers on this, on the RM, that we would be actually defeating the whole point of an RM district. So, so we believe that the current SAD, which, uh, which the LDRs do, do provide that we're not necessary, you're going to leave the zone. And here we feel by looking at the history uh, since 84, uh, and 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 the, the commission was not as thorough in 84. So we actually tried to pull all of the uh, all the findings from those years. Uh, the only thing that we were able to locate is the fact that if there was a provision that allowed all the uses so of an RM district. So they didn't choose to do the RM district in 84. Uh, it concludes to us that there are a lot of reasons happen to do with this shape of the property. So yes, the answer to your question is yes, indeed, Mayor. The, uh, the the applicability of the RM district would render us before you with so many variations that we wouldn't even be conforming to the RM district. Got it. And 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 I, I also want to just um, emphasize the fact that you know with an SAD you you actually see what's going to take place on the property. So basically, we're looking at what is going to happen. This isn't a maximum of 39 feet, and then to have it change. In the future, this is actually going to be a three-story building or buildings with 39 feet maximum, and I appreciate that. Right now, with the five stories um, or was five stories um, on that property, I think this just it meshes better with the, the surrounding community. All right. Any other questions? If not, then I'll um, take a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, thank you. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Wollston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Bernardo. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commission. See you again. Thank you. All right, moving on to Ordinance 05 21. In ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 4 Zoning Regulations, Article 4.4 .4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.13 Central Business District, CBD, Subsection 4.413 I2J, CBD Parking Standards, Minimum Number of Off-Street Parking Spaces, to extend the effective date to December 31st, 2024, providing a complex clause, a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. And Mr. Schiller's here. <laughs> Mr. Schiller, you've got the floor. Good evening. There you go. Good evening. We hear you.
Can you hear me now? We can. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a brief presentation about Ordinance 0521. Uh, again, Neil Schiller with the law firm of Saw Ewing, RNC and Lair, located at 515 North Flagler Drive in West Palm Beach, Florida. Here tonight representing Delray Swan LLC. Next slide. Our uh, request tonight is to essentially uh, extend the existing parking exemption from Ordinance 02-18 that is supposed to sunset on April 4th, 2021 and extend it to December 31st, 2024. We have received recommendations of approval by the Planning and Zoning Board and the Parking Management Advisory Board. Next slide. This is Ordinance 02-18, uh, which identifies a small part of the CBD Railroad Corridor subdistrict between Southeast 2nd and Southeast 3rd Streets. For any properties that undergo a change of use, uh, they do not have to provide additional on-site parking. Uh, again, as you uh, may remember, this was established to provide incentives to commercial property owners to redevelop or reuse their properties. As you know, parking is costly and land for parking is even more expensive and scarce. Next slide. This is the applicable area of the railroad corridor subdistrict only between Southeast 2nd Street and Southeast 3rd Street. It only affects 13 properties in total. Next slide. There, these are just some photos that we've taken uh, from Southeast 2nd looking north and then looking south, uh, and then additionally Southeast 2nd and Southeast 3rd uh, looking north and south respectively. Next slide. Uh, I took a, uh, an aerial and it just highlighted the particular area that this uh, ordinance affects. You can see that I've identified a new parking lot. You may remember that was approved in the area. Next slide. Here's a better version, uh, a zoomed in version of the uh, applicable area and the parking lot. Remember this parking lot has 61 new and improved spaces, nine new street lights. Improved landscaping. Um, the developer of the parking lot will share revenue with the city. The city will install those meters and enforce parking restrictions. The developer will reimburse the city $1,400 per month, and uh, the developer will maintain the parking lot. Next slide. This is just a rendering of the proposed parking lot when it's completed, and I have confirmed with the developer that they are going to start construction within 30 days. Next slide. This is the proposed language. It's highlighted in green and underlined. This is literally the only thing we're changing in the ordinance is just the date to December 31st, 2024. I decided that uh, December 31st was a better date rather than a random uh, April 4th, 2024 date that way. Anybody that's taking advantage of this program has a, a natural end date. Next slide. Uh, there are a variety of policies and objectives that were compliant with the comprehensive plan, uh, protecting and enhancing the village of the sea character, accommodating automobile access through innovative approaches, uh, reducing parking requirements in areas located within one quarter mile commuter rail station and along main transit corridors, uh, you know, supporting a variety of commercial and industrial uses on land with mixed use land use designations. Uh, I don't have to read the others. Next slide. Uh, additionally, we're in compliance with the Osceola Park Redevelopment Plan Neighborhood Update of 2019, more particularly Sex Strategy 2.4 Sub 3 to introduce parking incentives for redevelopment of properties. That's exactly what this ordinance does. And then uh, strategy 5.7 uh, sub three, which is expand parking with pervious services at commercial properties. Uh, and then additionally, you have the language directly from the Osceola Park neighborhood plan, uh, which is highlighted that to reduce excessive parking along residential roadways. Uh, another focus of the plan update is to address the need for additional parking for businesses in the railroad corridor area. Next slide. 
So again, uh, we've got recommendation of approval from Planning and Zoning Board and the Parking Management Advisory Board. Uh, at our Planning and Zoning Board meeting, uh, Mr. Quinlan of the Osceola Park Neighborhood Association called in and said the association supports this ordinance. Uh, we are consistent with a comprehensive plan, the Osceola Park Neighborhood Redevelopment Plan of 2019 and LDRs. And again, this ordinance only affects 13 properties total and extends the uh, existing program uh, three and a half years to end on December 31st, 2024. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much to the staff report. Um, I don't know if I need it. Okay, I'm not. All right. So I just want to make a, a very short presentation, but I just want to be really clear for the record um, that um, this ordinance change renews an existing incentive that's in the code that allows for changes of uses in existing buildings. Um, it would extend that program until December 31st, 2024. This only applies to existing buildings. It will not apply to redevelopments. If the buildings get torn down and a new class five comes forward, they have to park for their new project. I'm glad Mr. Schiller is not. I just want to make sure everybody knows. Okay. So, um, and again, it does apply to this small area here. Um, so it would facilitate the adaptive reuse of some of those projects that might otherwise get, um, you know, assessed for parking if they change use. And um, again, um, I did want to show that there have been improvements that the city has made in this area as well to um, provide for parking on a district level as opposed to lot by lot. So, you know, you can see that this this area was improved and as well as there's the Siri parking lot on the east side at 215 Southeast 2nd Avenue, which does provide for some public spaces sort of to serve this small, um, you know, little mixed use area. And as the applicant presented, um, Osceola Park is supportive and it does um, sort of follow in terms of providing incentives for redevelopment for the kinds of uses that are, um, you know, um, forward sort of their redevelopment vision um, that they would walk to. So again, um, the ultimate finding that the city commission is making is um, that it's um, consistent with the comprehensive plan and the um, LDRs. So um, when the um, agenda item was prepared and loaded into the system, um, we hadn't had the parking management advisory board meeting yet. However, this did go between um, the agenda and now, and it was um, recommended approval three to zero. It is a five member board, but there were only three present at the time. And uh, the planning and zoning board did recommend approval unanimously. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Very good. Okay, to the commission. Any questions, concerns? Seeing none. I think this is great. Motion. Motion to approve. Approve. Second. Okay, good. Okay. Very good. Um, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Neil. Good to see All you right. guys. Moving on to uh, 9C ordinance number 12-21. Last but not we... least, okay, in, ordinance of, in ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 96, Fire Safety and Emergency Services of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, by amending Section 96.02, Fire Safety Inspections to provide additional methods of collecting payment and imposing interest for delinquent fire safety inspection charges, providing a conflict clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. Okay, um, I think that uh, Chief Tommy's on the line if someone can allow him to speak. Madam Mayor, I can, um, while he gets unmuted, I could just provide a, a very brief overview. This is a first reading of an ordinance, basically to allow us, uh, to allow the city to collect 
Um, when we have uh, fire inspection fees that have gone unpaid, we needed a mechanism in our code to allow for that. And that's what this uh, would do on first reading. Um, I don't know if Chief Tommy would like to add to that or if he is unmuted at this point, but at this point, he can answer anything. I see his name up there. So if he'd like to say anything, you've got the floor, Chief. Sure, no problem. Um, just, so you, just so you know that um, in 2017, we instituted to uh, start collecting and start charging for inspection fees. So since then, we've been hit or miss on whether we do our collection. So this provides us a mechanism to enforce the collection of the delinquent fees, very similar to the way we do our EMS billing and EMS collection. So we really uh, mimic the same type of terminology and wording that we did in EMS billing to uh, match that for this, uh, for this ordinance. Very good. Um, do we have any questions or concerns? First reading. Make a motion then. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Okay, so we're. Now at the comments inquiries on non-agenda items, this is, uh, goes first to the city manager. Hey there, um, so good evening. I have two items for the commission's consideration. The first has to do um, the um, union contract that we have, have scheduled a special meeting for, for uh, Thursday at 2 p.m. Our actuary um, advised us that they really don't have time at that moment, they have about 15 minute window. So I'd like the commission's consideration to basically make uh, questions or any presentation from the actuary time certain at the 2 p.m. Um, to give them 15 minutes, if that's okay. When this is heard on Thursday, yeah? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. I appreciate that consideration. And um, then the basic rest of my updates are in my city manager memo. I tried to capture as many items as possible, but uh, if there's any updates that are needed by the commission, please just let me know. Will do. Thank you so much. City Attorney, Jalen. Um, just one clarification. I do apologize. Uh, Kateri, let me know that Mr. Denkler's appointment that we just handled today, item 7B, it's actually going to be for the full three-year term. So um, because the it's less than six months before um, the expiration of the term. So congratulations, Mr. Denkler. You will be on the board for three years. <laughs> That's all. That. All right. Very good. Thank you. All right. So moving on to uh, city commission, uh, Ms. Cassell, you are uh, recognized. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to try to be quick, but I actually have a couple of things. Um, first, I don't want to step on toes, but I'm going to right now, probably. Thanking Angie Gray, you, Mayor. Chief Sims, if he's still listening, Caesars, the police officers who participated in this fabulous basketball game where the police were against the kids and Vice Mayor Boylston, your participation as well. That was remarkably fun. I'm just glad we don't have any workers' comp claims as a result. <laughs> out there. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge item 6B on our agenda, this uh, resolution 4521 that we just passed through this evening is just another step in reducing single-use plastic, so I'm beyond excited. And uh, thank you, Ms. Alvarez, Ken Edwards, Health Stern, and the entire Green Board, because that is beyond exciting for me. Um, as the chair of the South Central Regional Wastewater Treatment and Disposal Board, I'd like to give you a brief update, which is that um, this is kind of a big update. One of the items on our last agenda was to authorize the um, operating committee to pursue and provide a bid for the second deep injection well. And this is going to get us closer to our requirements of the um, December 31, 2025 ocean outfall legislation. So this is exciting. Um, another update is on the PFAS. I had my first meeting, which was remarkably exciting. Um, and so there are two um, bills coming up in the Senate, one in the Senate and one in the House. And just super quick, um, Senate Bill 1054 provides a broad policy-based approach to the PFAS problem for all affected um, potentially responsible parties, um, including municipal sources. So this could be interesting for us to keep track of. 
Uh, the other one is the House Bill 704, which provides liability protections resulting from discharges of PFAS in firefighting foams, but that's only by airports, so that might not really impact us at all. Um, that's that. And then I am looking for consensus. And so um, I know this isn't a great time to be asking for money, but it's not a lot. And consensus, understanding the importance of the natural coastal habitats. Our recently implemented comprehensive plan um, requires us to preserve, protect, restore, and enhance the quality of naturally occurring coastal habitats, including our dune and beach system. And so I was uh, lucky enough to take the BPOA beach tour. And in the process, what I uh, realized is our dunes have some serious problems. And so they really do need some attention. And a lot, as time has gone on, we've paid attention to them, but it's sporadically and it, and we don't, I don't think we have a really consistent long-term plan establishing an ongoing program that assures uh, the Delray's um, biodiverse beach and dune system are restored to a healthy place and sustained because they are our most valuable asset. So um, I've been talking with a couple of gentlemen and the idea is um, proposing something aimed at establishing a detailed inventory of the existing dune vegetation and native biodiversity on the beach. And then um, basically the larger program involves education, ecological restoration, and long-term management. And how we view this as, um, you know, organizationally, the components would be the sustainability office, the green board, the Department of Public Works, the Parks and Rec, potentially the BPOA, um, I believe they're interested. And um, basically I'm requesting a consensus on a resolution with the following intent that the city will fully support the concept of establishing a sustainability program for the city beach dune system and fund the initial um, part, which will help us establish um, what the vegetation is now, which would be basically we refer to it as phase zero and think it would be approximately $25,000. And one of the other ideas that we talked about is that perhaps in the future, some funding for the beach could come from the beach parking. Um, but that's another thought, just throwing that out there. So would anyone like to comment? Or uh, I, I would, I would, uh, I would absolutely second that. Um, and uh, the best practice is to use your parking uh, funds for the area right around it, rather than lumping it all into one big sum. So I would also like to explore that. I, I you know, obviously not ready to make a decision on that, uh, but the, the expenditure, however, yeah, whatever the, the best process is, uh, Ms. Alvarez for moving that forward, um, I would be in favor. Thank you. You got, you have support. Yeah, oh, you guys, right. just clarify it, 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 but just so I can make sure we're clear on how we're moving forward. Um, I guess, uh, Commissioner Cassell, we have consensus. We would probably get together and work on the wording of that resolution to be brought forth for. Yes, I'll provide you something Sounds and great. then we can all work on that and then move together as a group. This is very exciting. Thank you all. This has been a lovely evening. We'll set something up. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, very good. So are you finished, Ms. Cassell? Yes. Okay, so moving like on. Enough. Vice, Vice Mayor Boylston, I believe your hand was up next that I saw. Oh, no, it was Deputy Vice Mayor Johnson. Deputy Vice Mayor Johnson, then I have you reversed. So go right ahead, Deputy Vice thank, Mayor. Thank, well, I wasn't watching in this particular case. I, thank you, uh, uh, Vice Mayor. Let's get, get it right. Deputy uh, Mayor uh, Boylston, I'll be quick. On February the 25th, the State League of Cities held a webinar of state preemption of short-term rentals. I know you all were probably busy doing something else at two o'clock on that particular day, but fortunately for me, Attorney Jellen was kind enough to be on the webinar and she has professionally given me her support to provide us a copy of the uh, resolution that the um, state league would like us to adopt. And I'm requesting that if you haven't had an opportunity to read it, I wanted you to have done it so that we could 
vote on submitting the resolution to oppose the state's preemption of Delray Beach's ability to regulate short-term rentals. It may or may not be too late. I haven't been following the bills that have been going through the Senate and the House to take away another um, freedom that the cities should have uh, delegated to them. So if you haven't had a chance to look at the resolution and cannot uh, unanimously approve it tonight, I would ask that uh, we do it as quickly as possible. I don't know, maybe a phone-in call to Lynn to say, yes, go ahead with it. I apologize. I apologize. I did not send it out, Deputy Vice Mayor Johnson. Oh, um, okay. I, uh, yes. So I do. I am sorry. There are two. It's two bills: House Bill 219 and Senate Bill 522. And there, there are your typical, you know, preemption um, bills that seek to um, lessen home rule power. And these are specific to vacation rentals. Um, the the gentleman who spoke, um, I think he is Representative Daly. And he's a big proponent of home rule. And he urged um, all of the at attendees um, who are in local government to consider these bills and to um, file them. So I can send them to the commission. I can get your consensus. Um, and if you're satisfied with them, I can just have the mayor execute. But it's, you know, it's it's the run of the mill, um, you know, seeking to retain home rule power uh, specifically to um, vacation rentals and the ability to not just regulate them, but also inspect the properties and um, in, in, uh, enforce uh, our regulations um, for code violations. I don't know if anyone wants to discuss it any further, but uh, there has been a huge proliferation of short-term rentals. They've become a nuisance in a lot of cities. I don't know the status of them in Delray because a lot of times we don't even know that it's a short-term rental. So if you would like to discuss it some more tonight, it's rather late, uh, but we do need to weigh in on whether or not you want to be responsible for setting the rules and regulations for short-term rentals in Delray Beach. I 100. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say I'm always for home rule over uh, anything other than that. But um, again, I didn't read anything that we are talking about. So uh, my my idea my my thoughts are yes, you know I, I certainly support it, but I just like to read it as well. So if you can get that out to us, it's short. Uh, I just short. I've already yeah, sent it, and you know what I can. Um, it's not really time sensitive, but what I'll do is I'll conform it to our our resolutions. And I'll have it on the next agenda. It's just a consent item. Okay, very good. Do you, do you think it'll be too late to affect the uh, bill they're going through now? I, I can, I'll double I, check. I if, it's a, if it's an issue, I can always just get consensus from the commission and ask you to authorize it. I think I think everyone here is pretty clear on your positions on home rule. And so unless somebody voices an objection after you review it, I can just ask the mayor to execute it if you want to give her that authority. Yes, I'm, I'm asking if uh, we can do it as quickly as possible. I believe the session is going to end in a few weeks. I don't know. I don't know the process or the progress of these, but they are they the short term rental lobbyists have a very powerful lobby, as you can imagine. So um, I think we should weigh in as quickly as possible. This was the first opportunity to get with you since the meeting. So I apologize for the urgency. Commissioner oh, Franklin yeah. has indicated his his uh, support. So you already have one vote. And okay, so yeah, Commissioner Boyle sent it as well. I will prepare it and have it for the mayor's signature this week. And then we will send okay. it out to Tallahassee. Thank you very much. Once again, you've um, told me why I do what I do when it comes to you. Uh, first, secondly, rather, I'd like to um, thank Anthea for her support, I don't know if she's still with us, but uh, at our recent CRA meeting, I believe that the information she provided in person was most appreciated and helped us as the CRA board to make the decision that we did make. I would also like to uh, thank ICM Alvarez. February was a really tough month. And if all of us would just 
take a moment to breathe in and think about what we went through, I would say from the first of the year. I, COVID is rampant, it's not rampant. I was downtown on Friday night. I, it's a, it's a, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it, but we're not gonna get into talking about COVID tonight, but I would like to ask, will we have an opportunity to discuss what is going to happen with our spring break and our beaches being open? Are we where we were a year ago, having that rolling uh, beaches open, not in Miami, not in Fort Lauderdale? Uh, okay, Boca, Boca's closed here. We've landed in Delray. So if we could get some kind of update um, from ICM Alvarez as to where we stand, because the county is still in charge. They opened up the beaches. Can we close them for a certain period or at least limit the, the hours that they are open to the citizen? I don't know. Uh, lastly, I'd like to once again thank uh, Attorney Jellen. Congratulations. You can tell that we rely on you more than I'd like to say, and I admire you because you you thrive. That's all I can say. Thank you, and good night. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yeah, I just have, I have a few things. Um, one, I think it was, it was just really neat um, tonight um, to, uh, to honor Mr. Strawn and, uh, and Coach TJ in the same night. And I just wanted to mention the staff, you probably saw that I was holding up my phone with photos of each. We should probably do that in the future. We do have, you know, we have the ability to put up a slide to show the person we're honoring or the person that's getting an award or the organization that's getting the proclamation. And probably wouldn't be a bad idea to, to do that uh, moving, you know, moving forward. Um, I uh, had my first AHAC workshop, my affordable uh, housing coalition workshop, and um, I'll be sending you the deck. I just got it today. It was eye-opening. There are so many incredible need and incredible tools out there for our needs for affordable housing, some of which are, are, are new to me. One thing which I thought was fascinating, the state passed HB 1339 in 2020. That states, notwithstanding any other law or local ordinance to the contrary, the governing body of a county or municipality may approve the development of housing that is affordable on any parcel zoned for residential, commercial, or industrial use without rezoning it. That's how important the state of Florida um, thinks housing is and affordable housing especially there are so many incredible tools that i didn't even know existed um i am going to be sending that deck to um to our city man manager and uh and then of course she'll send it out to all of you but i think it's worth maybe even turning into a future workshop so that we all really understand how important this is we are doing a lot of things that are good i was able to share a few of those things our projects leveraging the density uh, programs for affordable workforce housing. I mean, we got applauded, just so you know. All these towns, um, we've added over 200 workforce housing or approved over 200 workforce housing units, and we we got like applaud, applauded, especially for our three buckets program that we're working into our, our LDRs for all future projects. Um, but there is still a lot more we could be doing. And I, and I, uh, I think you guys will love this document. Um, I was able to go to the Palm Tran headquarters ribbon cutting this morning. And it was pretty neat because three years ago we were at the groundbreaking. Now we're at the ribbon cutting. It's a fantastic facility, one that we should take a tour of. And when we make any enhancements to city hall, there's a lot of best practices there. They invested in lockers and showers uh, for their for their team members. And of course, they are incentivizing their team members to use public transportation. And they had a really great saying, which they had everybody cheer, new way, new day, Delray, which I thought was pretty, which I thought was pretty fun and had several people mention to me how excited they are for the Aura project, which is right next door that they're hoping some of their employees will be able to live in and be able to walk to work, won't even need public transportation to get to work. So they're really excited about their, their new, their new neighbor. Um, last, lastly, I wanted to mention that um, while taking a tour for the project that we, uh, not the project, but the, the parking in Osceola Park with uh, the Swan Group. While taking a tour to understand that, um, the applicant, Brian Rosen, and his uh, his father 
showed me a uh, abandoned, not abandoned, but an empty storefront that they wanted to put something in temporarily for the next year or two. And they were hoping that it was going to be something, you know, community related. And I was able to link them with our Haitian um, Caribbean community that I've been working with for the last two years. Yeah, uh, with uh, Commissioner Mac Bernard, we're hopefully hopefully creating the first Palm Beach County Haitian Caribbean Community Center, and they just signed a lease where they will get that space for the next two years for free, and they'll be moving in, and it'll be the Haitian Culture Club, where they can start bringing resources to Delray Beach for the Haitian community in this two thousand square foot building. I wanted to say thank you to Brian Rosen and his company and his family for uh, providing this free space. And I'm really looking forward to joining the community in, in painting it and uh, in, in donating furniture to it and getting it up and running as the first Haitian Caribbean Community Center in Palm Beach County. And hopefully we'll play a big part in expanding it and getting it a forever home. Uh, this is actually, this is this is the last thing. Listen, I, I, I was going to comment about the inexcusable actions of of, of of our mayor and of Ms. Caruso in this election. We've all seen it. We're all tired of it. Um, but I've decided to save it for next meeting um, because we as a commission are either going to be addressing a mayor that attacks her colleagues every election and texts our staff that we are morons and out of touch, or we are going to address a new mayor that has taken the low standards set by few candidates in recent elections and brought it even lower. Uh, with the toxicity of uh, of this campaign. Both outcomes will need to be addressed head on by this commission so that we can move forward together as a city and continue and not continue this horrendous cycle that happens every few years, every time an election comes up. Um, and I know Mayor, tonight you said you used an election as, a, uh, as an excuse for certain actions and you told me to get over it. I don't wanna get over it. This, this, this shouldn't be happening every time we have an election. This team worked so well together out of the gate three years ago. We really did. And then the election comes around. Um, and so I am very much looking forward to discussing this in our next city commission meeting. And hopefully this is the last time that we have, our city has to be derailed um, around election time. Look in the mirror, my man. Okay, so oh, moving no on way. to, <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead and laugh. We'll, we'll have that discussion, you and I. Um, uh, on to uh, Commissioner Frankel. Thank you. Um, Mr. Boylston, uh, thank you for your remarks. Um, I have the utmost respect for you and uh, Commissioner Johnson, and it's a shame uh, we have to be uh, called names uh, when someone doesn't get their vote, but be that as it may, there's two unfortunate things I wanted to bring up tonight. One, a gentleman passed last week who really was a gentleman and uh, uh, did so much for our city. And his name was Richard Jones. And uh, just a very sad set of circumstances. And uh, my thoughts are going out to his wife and his family right now. The second unfortunate thing uh, is somewhat related to what Mr. Boylston stated. I woke up Saturday morning to an email from Gail Clark. And Gail Clark uh, decided to, in his public record, she decided to write, I'm glad Jeff Perlman is getting better, but honestly, he was at his best when he was in the hospital with looks like some emojis. Um, here's what I know about Jeff Perlman. Jeff Perlman served our city for many years. His wife, Diane Colonna, served our city for many years. So in the last year, I've seen just the most uh, unfortunate comments, whether that be on social media or public records, uh, for those that have contributed much less, in my opinion. Uh, they're, they're very uh, important on Facebook, yet not important in other areas, it appears. Uh, so uh, I, I condemn some action of Ms. Gail Clark. Um, I think it's sad uh, that she has to disparage uh, a mayor of our city who spent years and still does volunteering his time 
And whether you agree or disagree with positions or votes, uh, you, you don't have to say someone is doing better when he's almost passed away in a hospital in the COVID unit, in the ICU. Uh, it, it's, you know, between the Sydney Freeburg comments about Ryan Boylston's child, now this, uh, we, we've got new, new low, and, and I, I respect the mayor when she says, it's political, this is not political. It's disgusting. So I condemn these comments, and uh, uh, if any of my colleagues want to uh, refer to that, feel free, but uh, it's it, it just when when Ryan says we fit a new low, I, I stand by you when you said that, Mr. Boylston. We have hit a new low when uh, members of the public demean a former elected official and mayor in our city who almost died because of COVID. It's disgusting to me. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you for the time. Can I just add to this? Because if we're going to have this conversation, then I'm, I'm adding to it. I'm a sitting commissioner, and I think all of you here would say that I go out of my way not to offend people. We may disagree on process and policy, but I don't offend anybody, excuse me. And Ms. Caruso has a whole host of gentlemen, no, I shouldn't, I can't call them gentlemen, men, attacking me on a daily basis on social media, commenting about my spouse, commenting about my family saying things that are remarkably untrue, calling me words that I can't repeat on this because they're not appropriate. So let's apply the standard universally. You guys are supporting her and I, I, I'm, I'm not taking it personally. I'm not commenting about it, but if you're applying a particular standard, apply it to the lady that you're supporting as well. First, it's, it's offensive what she's saying about me. First and of all, no, I need to jump in. That. I need to jump in here. I stated I stated it in regards to both candidates. My statement referred to both candidates in their own unique way. So I just want to make that very clear. And I do not support Tracy Crusoe. I do not endorse her support from the dais. I will be at any event that the organization that invited me to the event endorsed me. So just I want to be clear. Oh, there is not one comment. There is not one public. There's not one public comment where I have endorsed or supported Ms. Caruso, not one. I do not have her sign in my yard. I do not wear her T-shirt uh, and either has uh, Mr. Frankel. So do not, Ms. Casal, put on the record that we support her. That is inaccurate. We've only been endorsed by the same organization. All the time, Ryan. No. We've had the okay, conversation. so hold up just a second, everybody. Listen, listen to me. Listen, listen just for a second. Just Ms. Casal, Ms. Casal, Ms. Casal. Listen to I me. haven't finished though. This is not the appropriate no place to discuss I things about that, politics. But I'm just saying I didn't have done nothing to provoke that kind of attack on me. It's, it's happening. And I and I and, and I, I haven't like either. Me. And I haven't either. And I'm just telling you, I, I I that's part of politics. But it doesn't doesn't really have a place when we're doing the business of the people. That's separate. So the two gentlemen that's basically brought in to bring that in, it really should not be the discussion or the topic tonight. You know, uh, I really have to tell you that's a separate discussion. You can have that together and not violate public, po I mean, uh, sunshine rules. You're allowed to have that conversation with one another, but I'm not sure that it's serving the purpose of the city. I, I have to tell you, I, I understand what you're saying and I, I think it's wrong, I do. Uh, I'm not saying that it I isn't. apologize and I apologize to the residents and I'm sorry, Mayor and residents, fellow commissioners, staff, every right. Um, now I'm gonna go into I, I think that that Mr. Frankel, did you need to speak about something more? Yes, thank you. Um, Ms. Cassell, I want to be very clear. This has to do with a resident, not political. I didn't say who she supported or who she didn't support. She stated a former mayor was better off almost dead in the hospital. Period. Yeah. That's what she said. It's not about a race or who's supporting who or whatever. She stated, and I quote, I'm glad Jeff Perlman is getting better, but honestly, he was at his best when he was in the hospital, i.e. dying of COVID. Okay? There, there's a difference to that. And, and you don't see me on social media talking bad about people or, or criticizing votes or doing that. This is not political. This is a lady who went after a former mayor and wished him, said he was better off when he was almost dead. That's how I interpret it. So I, I, I'm sorry, I don't see what's going on to you and your husband 
I, I don't condone that. This takes me back to a former blogger who used to disparage former Commissioner Gergera in the worst manner ever. And I don't stand for any of it. Uh, I don't call people names. I don't do any of that stuff. I'm above this Facebook nonsense. And, you know, you guys do, you can decide what you like to do, whatever. But we all got this email sent Friday night. It's not right. So it has nothing to do with any of the political races. I have one opponent. I'm running my own race. And I'll leave it at that. I just think it was wrong of Ms. Clark to do that. Thank you for the opportunity to follow up. Thank you. Mr. Boylston, are you with your hand up at two again? Okay, great. All right, so a couple of things um, uh, that were brought to my attention. Power lines on the beach are going underground. And I've gotten some calls to ask how it is that, or if there's any way of being able to find a way to get the cables, other cables underground too, because the poles stay up with the cables on it if in fact uh, the, um, the underground utilities, uh, the, the uh, FPNL utilities go under. So the cable and other utilities are not going under, and I'm wondering, is there a way that the city um, can, you know, encourage um, the burying of all cables? If we're going to have the bigger cables down, why wouldn't we have the smaller ones as well? It just is, it'll be aesthetically prettier. It'll also, uh, you know, eliminate the downtime when there are storms and all the reasons why um, FPNL is going underground versus keeping the um, the lines, the power lines up. So um, Jennifer, if you can follow up with that, that would be great just to find out if there's any way that we can push that or encourage while they're digging up or while they're burying. Uh, Commissioner Casal, do you have something? You want to say? Missy has her hand up. I see, oh, yeah. Okay. okay, I'm gonna recognize her. Missy Barletto, can we get her to be able to speak? Um, it, it is possible. Those programs are being done by private individuals and not at city expense. Oh. So, I mean, we could help the residents to make the connections with the, the other, um, with the other um, providers, but mm -hmm. it would be significant city expense for us to pay to have those things undergrounded. So, yeah, I, don't, I mean, we, I don't, yeah, that's not what I'm asking. I don't think that the city should be taking this on. I'm just wondering if there is a way to be able to um, encourage all of the cables to go underground. And if it's a private, privately initiated issue, why wouldn't they put it, be putting all the cables underground? Missy, do you have an answer to that? an FPL program that's going on and FPL doesn't have any influence over the other providers either. So, I mean, they, they talk to them, they give them an, an opportunity for that. The other providers haven't, haven't to date um, stepped up to the plate and wanted to participate. Do you think that maybe the, um, the, the, you know, the citizens, um, you know, asking for that to their providers or cable providers would, would make a difference. I just, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how, how th this could help or how we could move forward with it, help, help them move forward. Every situation is different, mm -hmm. but in the ones that I've looked at in the past where I've, I've tried to help facilitate that, that activity, the undergrounding of the, the AT&T and Comcast lines, which are the ones that remain on the poles, are at the residents' expense. Gotcha. So sometimes the residents are, are, I guess, willing to do that, and sometimes they're not, but you have to get that scheduled into their system. Gotcha. Okay, very good. Thank you for that, Missy. I appreciate it. Um, there was- Mayor, um, before you go any further, Mayor, yeah. may I interrupt? Yes, yeah. I'm on sorry. That. Yeah. On that uh, issue, if my uh, memory serves me well, we had a big discussion at one of our meetings uh, down south. We were talking about putting those G5, G whatever fours on the pole, and there was a big push to have that happen. So if we remove the poles, that's going to leave those telecommunication companies high and dry. So I'm sure we're going to get a pushback on that. Okay, well, this, Thank you. Just, this was just the beach area, and I don't think that we put any of those on the beach area um, poles. So this was only specific 
to where they're actually burying the um, the the FPNL lines right now. So I, I don't well, think thank it will you. Affect. You got it. Thank you. So um, at the TPA meeting, there was a vision zero, which is basically trying to get to zero fatalities on bikes, pedestrians. And even though I know that that's a really big reach, they really are asking, they're asking each city to consider doing a, um, you know, a, a resolution to try to strive for that. And if I have support, we can maybe bring that to our city too and just work towards trying to make it so that we have less you know, fatalities when it comes to bikes and, and, um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, walkers, pedestrian. Is that possible to get it on our, um, yes, okay, good. Um, and then the other thing is that when we were at, oh, also in the TPA, we do not have a, um, an alternate, an, an, an alternate, not that I've ever actually not, I've not missed, I've, I don't think I missed a meeting, but anyway, I was going to suggest, I don't know who, but um, Casal, because I know that Deputy Vice Mayor, you've got your hands full with the league, and I, I know that Casal, you have some issues. Are you okay just to be a backup in case? And the reason sure. I say to, you, say to you now is just because of the fact that we're all three in a, in a race as well, and whoever, whoever comes they, okay, great. Um, sure, thanks. And then um, I don't know if everybody else noticed or those of us that showed up at that basketball game over the weekend with the kids, but the garbage cans are just poorly placed. They are so far away, you have to, you have to, you, you, you're not surprised why the garbage ends up in and around the basketball hoop areas because people just leave it. There's no place to put it. You have to walk, you know, across a field to get to a garbage can. Um, I think that we need to be looking at uh, the placement of some of these garbage receptacles so that they make sense instead of having garbage to have to pick up. If we have the receptacles and pe people would put them in, they're not going to walk across a, 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 you know, a, a field to get to the garbage cans. So anyway, just wanted to put that out there to the city manager. Uh, notice that. Also, can we get an uh, update on the overlay downtown, uh, maybe at the next meeting, or not the next meeting, but the following one, because next meeting is the organ organizational meeting. So um, just to be able to follow up on that, regardless as to who's here, just it's an important uh, part of our uh, looking for planning and, and future um, uh, vision of our, our town. And then finally, um, the uh, the I had a sit down with the, um, Chamber of Commerce Director and also um, former Mayor uh, David Schmidt today, who is kind of taking the lead over there as far as the um, you know the, the the membership, and you know they were talking about um, the marketing of the city and how we're heading into um, a, a, a time that we could maybe take advantage of, and that we don't have that outreach like we did with the Delray Beach co um, Cooperative. If you remember, that was our one place that we would be able to push out a lot of advertising to bring people in that wasn't specific to downtown. It's the whole city. And so we don't have that any longer. And I know that we don't have right now um, an economic uh, development uh, um, director. These are two very big gaps as we're coming into a time frame when we want to grab as many people and bring them to our city as cities start to really open up and travel becomes, um, you know, kind of the top priority for everybody. And I think that we all are sitting in that seat. I cannot wait to get away from Delray because we've all been holed up here for so long. And I think that if we miss that opportunity of reaching out and trying to grab people to bring them here, this is a utopia. Um, I think that we, we will we will miss, and this is year round because I think that there's going to be a lot of travel coming up. People are going to really be wanting to take trips, and it won't matter if it's summer, winter, fall. It won't matter. So I'm just wondering if we shouldn't be looking at that, working with the chamber and getting that message out, and maybe we do some um, funding of trying to grab those uh, potential people to bring them in as soon as we are, um, people are traveling, starting to back travel. Now that we've got a good majority of, of first shots done in the seniors, it's going to really start taking off. And I think that we're going to probably see, you know, come this summer, most of us are going to have our first shot. Um, and uh, so that will happen that they're going to start feeling much more comfortable about traveling. And I hate to lose that opportunity, especially with all the hotels and the businesses that are really 
banking on, you know, having a, um, a strong, uh, you know, strong coming out. And this is heading into our downtime. So this would be the time to really kind of, uh, not right now, but I'm saying that after we get to that point, but start really dragging people here, even though it will be warm, it, it'll be nice. It'll be a nice change. So I just don't want to miss that opportunity. And um, so, yes, Jennifer. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, I, as a reminder, uh, we did, uh, the commission did approve the appropriation of some funds for this specific yes. effort to join forces with the DDA and the chamber for that type of marketing um, campaign. So, um, and they've been gracious enough to basically take you know, most of it and we were just going to provide the support with the funding. So that is um, appropriated $100,000. Perfect, okay, just, sounds just good. As soon as it makes sense to do it, let's get on it. And we probably want to go a little bit ahead of it so that we can make sure that we do the right thing um, with respect to, um, you know, getting people here. So, and um, on a on on the note that um, you know, Commissioner Frankel spoke of, it was a devastating blow to our community um, about the passing of uh, Mr. Jones. Um, I knew him personally. Kids went to school with my kids. And um, it was it was just uh, overwhelming to to even you know have to deal with that, and I, I feel for the family. So please keep them in your prayers; they're going to need it. Um, if there's nothing more, we'll we'll, we'll um, end the meeting. Okay.